Good morning, everyone. Uh, the congressman is a few minutes late. These things happen. And so I'm going to wait about three minutes before we start. And if he still is not here, we'll begin. And then when he arrives, he'll come and, and, uh, and speak then. So we'll, we'll just wait a few minutes. Okay, please take your seats. We're ready to start. Well, welcome. Good morning, everyone, on this steamy morning in Washington. I'm Jim Glassman. I'm a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And we're here to tackle a very important subject at a conference titled Outsourcing the Vote. And we're going to be looking at the role of proxy advisory services in corporate governance. And the, the basic subject, though, I would define as how do we develop a system that allows shareholders a voice in the corporation's that they own. How should that system be structured? Or do we need such a system? Or do shareholders need such a voice in an era like this? Or do they want a voice? Uh, or should it be their voice or the voice of the intermediaries that stand between them and the corporations whose shares they own? Uh, this issue has become more complicated and more urgent in recent years because of two developments. The first has been a vast increase in the way, in, in the ownership of shares through institutions. So now 96 million Americans own mutual funds, mainly because of the rise of 401ks and IRAs. So it's a, it's a different kind of ownership, 
especially with the proliferation of index funds. People are, are less connected to the shares that they own. The second big development is just a greater concern about corporate governance. Um, and that concern is quite legitimate, um, but some of the concerns are invading space that traditionally had very little to do with corporate governance. And I think one of the great examples of that is the, the, the conflict minerals uh, provision in Dodd-Frank. The current system, uh, which is now about a dozen years old, has developed through some unintended consequences that we're going to be discussing uh, based on the original regulations that were, that were approved by the, by the SEC. And one of those unintended consequences is that two firms, ISS and Glass-Lewis, have become, at least in my opinion, the dominant forces in corporate governance decisions today. Uh, what is the answer? Well, I don't think there's any doubt that the current system is broken, but how to fix it? The SEC itself is now focusing on the matter of conflicts of interest, and while that may be uh, productive, uh, conflicts of interest abound in all of our lives, and what's more important than the conflicts themselves is the consequences of those conflicts. My former colleague at the New Republic, Michael Kinsley, used to say, uh, we all have conflicts of interest uh, when, when a wife and a husband decide to have another child. That's a massive conflict of interest. Um, conflicts of interest solved through regulatory means can often lead to regulatory capture, and rather than solving the problems, they, they exacerbate them. So that's one of the questions that we're going to be discussing today. We have an excellent panel, or two panels, to discuss the matters. Um, the first will be moderated by Peter Wallison, and the second by me. We have AEI scholars. We have scholars who've come here from, uh, from the West Coast and from Philadelphia. We have three former SEC commissioners, uh, and we have practitioners. Unfortunately, we don't have anyone from ISS, but that was not through lack of trying on my part. Um, but we don't have subpoena power here at AEI, and uh, we probably wouldn't want to exercise it anyway. Certainly, uh, the views of the proxy advisory services will be well represented by the able Bob McCormick of, of Glass-Lewis. So now it's my honor to introduce our speaker, our keynote speaker today, Patrick McHenry, who is now in his fifth term in the U.S. Congress, representing North Carolina's 10th Congressional District. Um, he is a member of the Committee on Financial Services of the House, which held a hearing on this subject a year ago, and he is the chair of the Oversight and Investigations Subcommittee of that committee. Uh, we're very, very pleased to have Patrick McHenry with us today. He's knowledgeable about this subject, as well as I know one of his, his great interests uh, is um, crowdfunding, but uh, he knows about these esoteric matters, and so I'm going to turn this over to Congressman McHenry. Well, thanks so much, and uh, it's an honor to be at uh, AEI, uh, you know, a revered institution from those of us that are trying to craft uh, good and wise policy on Capitol Hill uh, and those that are trying to move the, the nation forward. So it's uh, wonderful to be at an institution that is uh, known for the deep dive uh, on tough policy matters and, and conveying it in a way that is understandable to those of us that uh, have a very harried life on Capitol Hill so that we can help uh, move the cause forward. And I, I apologize for my lateness this morning in particular because there's a little something going on among House Republicans uh, this week. Um, there is uh, you know, a, a, an opening in leadership, which is a rare occurrence. And when there is such a rare occurrence with such enormous competition, right, uh, there are significant consequences. And one of the consequences this morning is that my 
time was uh, immensely taken up. But uh, Jim, it's an honor to be with you. Um, I've been reading you, uh, it, much of what you've been doing, and uh, followed your career for many years, uh, going back to one of my first jobs in Washington. Um, and, uh, and so it's an honor to be with you. Um, and it's an honor to be uh, with, um, well, the significant uh, uh, presenters today. Uh, my friend Peter Wallison, who is a frequent uh, uh, a, a frequenter of, uh, of the environs of the Hill and committee rooms. I see Hester Pierce is here as well, and she's a, a favorite among many of us on the Hill. Um, but, um, you know, well, and, and of course, every uh, significant uh, uh, commissioner from the SEC of recent time is, has made their way here on, a, on this hot morning. Um, but in particular, who brings us here together? Harvey Pitt. Right? Uh, not out of malice, not out of goodwill, um, not out of lack of goodwill, um, but out of unintended consequences. And that is often the case with regulation, uh, that, that we deal with the aftermath of unintended consequences, and that is what is here today. Uh, but before I get into really the, 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 the meat of the, the discussion, which is uh, addressing the problem, and what are the action items that we can take away from this, from my perspective as a policymaker on the Hill. The most interesting thing to me as a member of Congress for the last uh, five terms, and having served in the state legislature before that, is when you get involved in an issue set, right? You believe that, uh, you, you know, I spend much of my time on financial services policy. And, and so, um, but you interact with every significant expert if you're really interested in the issue, right? So we have people that spend a, a whole career on one part of a market structure issue. We have another person who spends a whole career on the exchange of, 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 of commodities, but not even commodities, a single commodity. And yet I'm supposed to walk into the room and I'm supposed to, in a groundbreaking fashion, tell you something you do not know, which is absolutely ridiculous. So, hear me out, all right? Um, but I will attempt to give you my perspective even though I'm talking to a room of, of experts. Um, and so, what we deal with today, and I, I concur with many of you and your view on this question of proxy advisors. For proxy advisors, um, we have to look to history. We have to look to history and, and it's often said that history repeats itself and it's also often said that that's not an accurate statement. It doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And in this case, the rhyme with proxy advisors is what we faced with a duopoly among credit rating agencies and the results of that duopoly. Now, in this case, we have a regulatory impediment uh, to a significant competition that can be remedied. So I think when we begin with that perspective that we have uh, a, a similar uh, uh, comparison in, uh, in history, uh, we see that um, there the similarities between credit rating, credit rating agencies and proxy advisory firms is that you have an over-reliance on outsourcing of these responsibilities from market participants, right? Beyond that, we also have a lack of competition and we have significant uh, perceived conflicts of interest. Um, you can talk about uh, misrated uh, securities in the run-up to the crisis and the results of those misrated securities. The market uh, outsourced deep thinking um, to credit rating agencies, and we see the aftermath of that. Um, you also see that uh, in similar fashion, in 2003, the SEC issued uh, their rules on and, uh, mutual funds and investment advisors uh, on adopting these procedures. I don't think the intention was to fully outsource it, uh, the thinking uh, to other groups that don't have responsibility to market participants. Um, and likewise, you can see uh, that is an ana analogous situation uh, as well with the credit rating agencies. So these are unintended consequences, I believe, not a, uh, as a result, and I'm sure we'll hear this from, from the panels coming up, um, but it's simply, uh, it's, it's simply false assurances that are given uh, to those that, uh, that, uh, that participate in, in, uh, in, in outsourcing of their votes uh, to uh, 
or uh, determinations on their votes to other firms. You also see a lack of competition. The barriers to entry into this are very similar uh, to what, um, what we saw with the credit rating agencies. When you have the proxy advisory uh, industry controlling, uh, in essence, two, uh, two participants controlling 97% of the market, uh, that is obviously a market failure. Um, you also see that the barriers to entry are significant because uh, they're producing a mass commodity. When you have a two-month uh, two window uh, governing uh, the enormous number of votes that are just simply unfathomable to the average investor, the average owner of mutual funds does not contemplate how many individual firms they own and the consequences of their ownership uh, through a fund uh, on, on the impact of the governance of those of those. Um, uh, companies. So the other thing that results from this, obviously, is that when you outsource uh, to a, a second party um, in order to protect yourself, protect yourself from legal action, you're outsourcing to, to a group that doesn't have any real consequence uh, for their decision making. And they're also open, as, uh, as look, as Jim stated with this, with uh, conflicts of interest, they're also open for business in terms of uh, who seeks their advice or seeks action through these proxy advisors. Um, and, and so that's the real game in town. If you want to have an impact, if you're an activist investor, if you're from some folks that will be participating later today, uh, they obviously like it. It gives them a real opportunity uh, to go in and make their case to an outside group that has no responsibility for shareholder value. If that's not problematic for the market, if that's not problematic for my constituents, my average everyday constituent who's trying to save for retirement, I don't know what is. So with those conflicts of interest in the outside groups playing a significant role, you have to have a check and balance. Well, the check and balance is responsibility. The check and balance is, is ensuring uh, that those that, uh, that are forced into this process through a regulatory regime that they have another option so that you can inject competition either in-house um, or opening up a variety of opportunities for them. And I'll get into that in a moment. So if shareholder value is of secondary consequence to you, that affects your votes. As we're seeing on Capitol Hill with leadership elections, if you have no state in, stake in the game, your levels of responsibility are significantly different. So my House Democrat colleagues have a different choice for leader and whip uh, for, that House Republicans control, right? They don't have the same responsibility. They don't have the same stated goals. So you want to see a conflict of interest. Well, let's bring in my Democrat colleagues into my Republican uh, conference meeting and allow them to elect my Republican leadership. Actually, how about this? Why don't we simply... I'll outsource my vote to someone else who doesn't have any responsibility to this process. And maybe, at the end of the day, maybe, um, uh, you know, ensuring good public policy, uh, you know, conservative public policy is not their goal. Maybe that's not even in their list of criteria. So, you see the problems, the practical problems of a complex issue on an average well, I shouldn't say average, because Congress is indeed unique uh, for many and varied reasons. Um, but, but the idea is a significant one. You also have the problem that we all face when we go into the ballot box. A problem is this. I walk in in North Carolina and see 25 people on the ballot, 25 different elections on the ballot. And I've been involved in the political process for quite a while. There are some elections of those 25 that perhaps I don't want to make a decision on. That's between me and that paper ballot and that little pencil or pen that they give you, right? Well, if I skip an election, I'm okay with that. I don't have the obligation to vote on every election, every question on the ballot. That liberation is actually a helpful thing. That means that people that are much more deeply engaged in this process in that particular election or have a better feeling for the two candidates, maybe the failure is that I know both candidates and therefore 
I don't want to give either one of them my vote. I'm not saying I do that, right? I do that. So, so obviously that has an impact as well. So these are some of the issues that, that, that I think about when we talk about uh, when we talk about this issue of, of proxy advisory, uh, the proxy advisory industry. And if we talk about the industry, we're really talking about a duopoly. And so uh, the question now is what are the remedies? What are the remedies as I see it as a policymaker? I understand the problem. And I understand the problem enough uh, to understand the general direction we need to go in. And I'll leave it up to the experts here in this room uh, to come up with the, fi the, the individual commas and uh, shalls and mays of the process. But what we have to do in terms of uh, policy making on the Hill, I mentioned checks and balances. And in our system of government, checks and balances are a very important thing. So I think the most important thing uh, to say from, you know, it's number one, remedy number one, is that for the SEC to fix this problem. Uh, the SEC fully has it within their power to address this issue, to come up with a sensible solution, and move the ball in the right direction. I have uh, great hope that they will do that. I also uh, believe that action number one for the SEC is to remove the no action letters, number one. I think it's important that uh, when you have, specific, you know, when you be, that, that is the fundamental first step in this, when you remove those no action le uh, letters. And it will be a notable first step and send the right signal, I believe, uh, uh, to the marketplace. Uh, second, I believe that uh, you know, the SEC should identify transparency and efficiency and accountability measures uh, to inject competition. Um, I think it's important that we know how the sauce is made. Uh, their decision-making processes. I think that will also be a, a very helpful competitive measure as well. Third and fine, uh, third, I should not say finally, but third, um, we, should we should permit uh, mutual funds to actually uh, determine through a cost-benefit analysis um, and a, a deep economic analysis what is of consequence, what affects shareholder value. And if it does not share, affect shareholder value, you have no obligation to cast a ballot on that. You don't have to make a decision one way or the other, and you will not uh, be held. You will not be held legally liable for making something, making a decision, or not making a decision that does not have shareholder value. Um, I, again, that is the skipping of the question on the ballot. I think that is a very helpful thing to the whole process. That we don't have an obligation to cast ballots on things that do not matter for our shareholders. If we have a question about social impact investing, they make it very clear their criteria for how they're going to invest uh, folks that want to have a social impact. The triple bottom line and the question of that, they can make that clear on how they're going to cast their votes on these important issues. If climate change is your number one issue, your investors know that, and they, they understand that your, uh, their focus is not simply on the, the bottom line question there, but it's also a question of uh, social impact. They can measure that, and we should give them the opportunity to do that. But for my average everyday uh, mutual fund customer in my district, uh, that's not their investing style. This is only, that's only a small bit of the whole marketplace. They should be permitted to, to make those decisions that they view as of impact, but the average everyday investor should be liberated from making decisions that they don't believe have any impact on their bottom line and their investment returns. Now, The final piece of this is the check and balance. And if the SEC does not act, and does not act in an appropriate manner, Congress will take action. Um, the Financial Services Committee in the House of Representatives has a fantastic leader named Jeb Henserly. Um, and Jeb uh, has a similar view uh, of the world as, as I do. And uh, believes that uh, this check and balance that we must have on the Securities and Exchange Commission is real and meaningful. We will exercise that check and balance along with my colleague and other subcommittee chairman, Scott Garrett of New Jersey. 
Um, and we all concur that if the SEC does not move appropriately, congressional action will be required. And so I want to tell you that this is important to us on Capitol Hill. It's an important issue, though the headlines may be other things. Those of us that work on substantive policy care deeply about this, getting it right, and the impact it will have and can have on good corporate governance, investor protection, and market returns. That is, after all, what we should be about as a matter of public policy. And so I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, a room of experts, about something that you are far more versed than any member of Capitol Hill. The important thing, though, is that we on the Hill know where to go for great guidance, information, and, and a far-ranging um, look at the marketplace and the impact that we should have with better public policy. And so I thank my friends here at AEI and uh, certainly appreciate uh, your indulgence in this rather warm uh, uh, morning. Uh, but I uh, also look forward to the dialogue that will result uh, later today. So thanks so much. God bless. Thank you, Congressman, for showing that you really do have a great deal of expertise in this area. And I, I should say that, um, if you don't mind my asking the first question, um, I think you made a, a very significant uh, pronouncement this morning um, about moving on the no action letters. We'll get to the nuances of those letters later, but I think it's safe to say that these are the, the reason that we have the system that we have today rather than the original regulation. It was the interpretation in the no action letters. And then you said that if the SEC does not take action, then Congress will move appropriately. Um, so is it your understanding that uh, Congressman Henserling and others have the same view that you have on the no action letters? So when you say move appropriately, does that mean move appropriately on those letters that set up the current system? Uh, the answer is yes to both. Um, uh, you know, Jeb is a very well-known uh, institution on Capitol Hill and among conservative thinkers. Um, and his approach, and uh, I, I like to think I model much of, of what I'm doing based off of his, uh, his approach. He got here a term before me, so I, I, and he's my chairman, so certainly I should say that. But um, I also think that uh, he is a, a very level head and, uh, a, a, you know, a very thoughtful approach. Um, my colleague Scott Garrett is as deeply interested in this as I am, um, and and so yes, if the SEC takes uh, appropriate measures, Congress will not have to take action. Uh, and the appropriate measures obviously begin first and foremost. And um, the central focus of this is the question of no action letters. So yes. Okay, I want to uh, open the floor to questions. And one thing I, I neglected to say in the beginning is that the congressman course, is a deputy whip, and so the leadership uh, race, races are important. And, um, and I will also, uh, the congressman has also very generously said that he'll, he's happy to answer questions on, on broader subjects as well besides the, the one at hand today. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and wait for the microphone and then identify yourself. We don't have a great deal of time for questions, but let's uh, get some. Hi, um, I'm Stephen Lee uh, from Global Clean Consulting. Uh, my question is uh, regarding shareholder value. Uh, the, is there any case for uh, determining the uh, who really have a stake, especially this, uh, traders who take temporary interest, or this, uh, people who can take temporary positions in a particular company to influence uh, this in certain situations? And those are really not the kind of shareholder value that we are looking to try and promote. So the question is, is there a case for maybe determining that you should own a stock for maybe at least one year before you're allowed to cast any votes? Well, I, you know, that's a, it's an interesting question, but not, uh, I don't think, uh, Im important to the discussion we're having today. Um, that is a, a far less consequence, in my view, than this question of, uh, of uh, the proxy advisory firm's role and the duopoly that they have. Um, that, that is something that I, I don't think the SEC needs to spend time determining at this point. There's enough on their plate. 
um, uh, before they, they start uh, rethinking that. The, the real issue with uh, proxy advisory, uh, the proxy advisory industry, is that, um, you know, it, at the heart of this, you have mutual funds outsourcing their vote. The hold, for, the hold time for mutual funds is, is very significant, and, and it doesn't pose those concerns in terms of the time element uh, that you, you raise. Let me just ask another quick question, because you, you, you also recommended that uh, mutual funds determine what is consequential, and if it does not have an effect, they can uh, skip making a decision. You gave the, the excellent comparison of different lines on the, on the voting card that you may want to skip. But um, mutual funds are often worried about getting sued, and so uh, if they think that um, that they need to make decisions uh, because of liability issues. Uh, they're, they're only too happy to outsource recommendations to, uh, to others that will protect them from being sued. Um, don't you think that's kind of a, a almost insurmountable problem? No. <laughs> I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist. Um, I mean, so imagine this. In your ever, average everyday life, is an, a, you know, if you could outsource any responsibility to a third party, how much easier everything would be for you, right? Oh, no, I didn't make that. So, well, no, we outsource it. We're fine. So, so actually, outsourcing liability is, a, is an, an ex extraordinary thing. At the heart of this, if you want to think about how revolutionary uh, the result of the SEC uh, regulation is, is that we have less responsibility and less liability in the process. Um, so simply outsourcing it frees you. That's absurd. That's absolutely absurd. We need to deal with that question of liability. If a third party has, is free of that, and in essence they are, right, because they're, they're, they're producing a mass commodity, it seems, and that seems to be uh, uh, commensurate with their pricing structure as well, in that, in that setting, it's going to be hard to pull them back, save for resolving that liability question. And I think we should resolve that liability question. And if the SEC doesn't think they can do it, that's why we're preserving congressional opportunity and action here. And that, that liability question, of course, is at the heart of these, of the, of the letters that you referred to. Um, well, we don't have any more time, and I really appreciate you coming, uh, Congressman. You, you certainly have given us a lot to think about. You've been extremely uh, forthright on this very, very important issue, and I can't think of a better person to kick off this conference than you. So thank you so much. So will the uh, first panel come on up? Peter Wallison will take charge. I, I, I do want to mention that, um, that we are uh, on streaming video. People are watching from all over the country. And um, we hope they'll be properly edified. this thing. Ah, yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. It's been a while since I've been up here with these mics. <laughs> okay. We heard a wonderful introduction from uh, Congressman McHenry. Covered all of the issues that I think uh, the two panels will, will address today. The, the way to think about this, of course, is that uh, the SEC has created an issue around the question of 
uh, whether there's a conflict of interest when an investment advisor or the manager of funds uh, is, is voting shares. And if, and if there is a conflict of interest, then there could be liability, there could be litigation, there could be problems with the SEC's regulation itself. And so the easy way for um, a mutual fund, for example, to handle this problem would be to outsource it. And in fact, the SEC has uh, given that opportunity uh, to mutual funds, in fact, suggested to them that they can, in, in one of the releases, cleanse themselves of any possible conflicts of interest by having some sort of procedure which assures that they follow the recommendations of some independent party. Um, we're going to try to make this particular um, panel, and I think Jim's will be the same, as interactive as possible. So we're not going to have um, initial speeches by the members of the panel. What we will do is I'll ask a, an opening question and then maybe a follow-up question. Each person on the panel will have an opportunity to um, speak for, I, I think, a total of about 10 minutes, and, and then there will be questions. So an opportunity for questions, so I hope all of you will note down the things that uh, you are interested in so you can ask a question when we have the time near the end of this panel. I'll introduce the people who will be talking in, uh, in the order in which they will be asked a, an opening question. Um, and they'll start with Harvey Pitt way down on, the, on your left, my right. Uh, Harvey is the CEO and global business of the global business consulting firm, Colorama Partners. He was chairman of the SEC, as just about everyone in the world knows, uh, between 2001 and 2003. Next to him is Glenn Borum, who's a principal of the Vanguard Group and controller of each of Vanguard's funds. He currently oversees Vanguard's governance program, which covers funds with assets of about $2 trillion. Next to him is Jill Fish. Jill is the per Perry Golkin Professor of Law and co-director of the Institute for Law and Economics at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She teaches and writes on corporate law, corporate governance, and securities regulation. Damon Silvers, who is next to Jill, is the special counsel and director of policy for the AFL-CIO. He is a member of the Investment Advisory Committee of the SEC. And right here next to me is my friend and colleague at AEI, Alex Pollack, who is a resident fellow at AEI. He was formerly the president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago from 1991 until 2004, among other outside activities. He is the lead director of the CME group. Um, and talking about Alex, I want to tell the panel that this is the Alex Pollack method of telling people when they've talked enough. It's, it has that perfect, that perfect resonance. And so even Alex, even Alex may be victimized by this. Um, but in any event, uh, the, first, the answer to the first question, I think, will probably be um, about five minutes or so. And then I'll ask a follow-up question uh, for each of you, um, if there's still time left. Uh, to cover another aspect of, of, this, of this issue that I know you're expert in. So we'll begin with Harvey, and, the, and Harvey is the appropriate person to begin with because it was in his tenure at, uh, as chairman of the SEC uh, that the, the key rule was, was developed. Now, he had left the F SEC about a month before that rule was actually promulgated, and many of the no action letters and so forth that came up after it were not part of his tenure. But the, the question I would have of Harvey, of course, is you were obviously involved, Harvey, in the development of this, this rule uh, on the duties of, of um, investment advisors. Has it worked out in any way the way you thought? And what did you have in mind at the time, it was under development uh, that was different from the way it worked out. Up here, Harvey. On the, on on, the it's a, it's, it, this puzzled me too. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, 
Good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure uh, to be here, even though just as in my family, I see I'm being blamed for anything and everything <laughs> that may go wrong. Um, the um, rule was uh, something that I um, actually favored and uh, pushed because um, there were difficulties uh, with mutual funds and other investment advisors, portfolio managers, um, not having defined policies as to how they would vote shares, when they would vote. So our goal was very simple. We passed a very simple rule, we thought, uh, which was um, that uh, if you managed a portfolio, uh, you would develop a policy as to how you might vote the shares. And then 60 or 90 days after um, you actually voted shares, you would tell shareholders how you voted. Um, very simple. Um, there were, if the rule had been left as it was adopted, no unintended consequences, although there was certainly opposition from the mutual fund industry. Um, what happened is you uh, correctly uh, indicated, but it, it sometimes gets confused. People talk about the SEC. The SEC staff responded to two no-action letters. And unlike um, most no-action letters, which are intended to interpret um, or give guidance to people as to how they can uh, conform to an existing rule, uh, these two no-action letters um, revised the rule that the SEC adopted. Um, and although it happened uh, after I left the SEC, as Peter pointed out, uh, nonetheless, it shouldn't have happened at all, and people should have understood um, that this is a significant problem because there were no procedures, policies, and the like uh, formulated. Um, the no action letters, one to Egan Jones and the other to ISS as um, proxy advisory firms, basically said that if an advisor has a conflict and cannot actually vote shares of stock without divulging the conflict, the advisor can delegate and outsource the vote to a third party, provided the advisor makes that part of uh, its policy. And eventually, the second no action letter said it won't even matter if the proxy advisory firm has a conflict. This is beyond my wildest understanding. But it won't matter if the proxy advisory firm has a conflict on the issue, as long as they have generally good conflict procedures. Um, this um, was something that had no predicate in the rule, and it is interesting that the result of this has recently been borne out by a Penn State study, which came out uh, in April, uh, actually on tax day, April 15th. Um, but in it, this Penn State study found that 25 percent of mutual funds rely almost entirely on ISS recommendations, one of the two proxy advisory firms that control uh, the marketplace, uh, Glass-Lewis, the other one, uh, wasn't studied. And um, it indicated that there are active voting funds that vote independently of ISS, and presumably Glass-Lewis, um, frequently voting in opposition to ISS, and those funds have better returns. Their um, uh, annual returns are approximately um, 85 uh, basis points annually higher than passive voting funds. So the um, consequences uh, weren't unintended or intended. They're the result of two interpretive letters um, that changed and modified the rules in question. Harvey, you, you said something that was of interest to me because we are, uh, interest to all of us, because we are talking about things that mutual funds apparently do 
voluntarily and, and as you say, 25 percent, according to this study, actually rely entirely on proxy advisors. But you said that mutual fund, the mutual fund industry objected to the rule, to the rule, which was much more benign than what turned out to be the, um, the no action letters. Why did, why did the mutual fund industry object, as far as you can recall? Um, there were a number of, of reasons. Um, first, um, they were concerned that the paperwork would be gargantuan. Um, and um, um, we, um, uh, we looked at that and um, uh, found that they, they wouldn't be gargantuan. Second, they were worried that there would be electioneering that people would put pressure on mutual funds uh, and others to um, basically vote a certain way. Um, uh, that was, um, we thought, um, manageable if there was no disclosure of actual voting until months after the actual vote and um, if the policies were generic, that is, there was no requirement to state how a fund would vote in any specific case. And so the rule was amended before it um, was published and finalized to make certain um, that general policy statements would be acceptable. Uh, but it was a function of the portfolio securities um, really being the property of the owners of the mutual fund. And the concept was those people should have the right transparently to know how their shares had been voted um, as part of a management function. Uh, somehow um, things um, uh, took a different turn after the rule was adopted. Harvey, uh, one other question. Uh, the, this issue of fiduciary obligation to vote, uh, Congressman mentioned it, Jim mentioned it. Um, was that under consideration? Did you have a thought? Did the SEC have a thought at the time about the answer to that question? Um, it, I would have said um, no. Uh, it, it certainly didn't come up. Um, at the SEC roundtable on proxy advisory firms in December, um, it was pointed out that there was um, language in the adopting release, which is a commission document, not a staff document, um, which suggested um, that there were fiduciary obligations to vote securities. Um, um, I believe that that statement um, has been um, taken uh, and expanded beyond where it belongs. Um, the congressman correctly pointed out a view that I, I feel strongly about, which is if the person, if a person who owns shares directly can decide not to vote, then mutual fund managers and other portfolio managers should be able to decide not to vote. The difficulty that the funds have, and I um, am not persuaded that the SEC can solve this problem simply by withdrawing um, the no action letters, um, is that portfolio managers will be worried that they will be sued if they don't cast votes on certain issues. And there will be a cost associated with that even if they ultimately prevail. To my way of thinking, the standard could well be, and some funds have adopted this policy, um, that as a statement of their voting practices and policies, funds would say if an issue um, is perceived by us as uh, directly affecting or uh, the value of shares, the economic relevance of the issue, we will vote on that issue. But if it is a social agenda issue or, or things that we perceive as only at best tangentially related to the value of securities, um, 
it is likely that we will not vote unless it's an issue about which we feel strongly. Something along those lines mm -hmm. should suffice. It should not be a breach of fiduciary duty, and if the SEC embraced that, um, it would probably go a long way to relieving what I think uh, without that are legitimate concerns by portfolio managers that they'll wind up in litigation. Okay, thank you very much, Harvey. Uh, Glenn, um, how does Vanguard use proxy advisors? Sure, before I answer that, let, let me just uh, piggyback on something Harvey said because it, it, it really tracks our voting and perhaps we'll get back to this, but there are a range of issues on which, um, as, as I describe our, our voting process, if you were to look at our voting record, you'd see that we do abstain from voting on a range of issues, typically social environmental policy issues. There are also instances in markets outside the U.S. where we don't vote on particular matters because the, the costs of voting, either through reducing the liquidity of shares or re-registering re shares to vote at meetings outside the U.S. would, we think, interfere with the management of the fund. So, um, we, we, as a general matter, vote on just about everything, but there we have set aside a range of issues on which we will abstain from voting. It's still a vote cast per se in, in most instances, but it doesn't reflect a hard for or against the issue. Um, but to, to circle back, um, just to orient you to Vanguard, if, if you're not familiar, um, Vanguard's an investment management firm uh, primarily in the mutual fund space in the U.S., we have assets approaching three trillion dollars. Two trillion of that is in is in equity, uh, equity securities. So we're entitled to vote at annual meetings for somewhere on the order of 3,800 companies in the U.S. and 7,000 companies outside the U.S. on an annual basis. Um, we have a process in place uh, that we manage largely internally. So we we don't haven't availed ourselves of, of the no action uh, relief to delegate to to proxy advisors we have a team of uh, between 12 and 15 analysts depending on the time of year back uh, back in Malvern outside Philadelphia that analyze uh, that analyze the the matters presented for a, for a vote of shareholders we do use proxy advisory firms in a number of capacities though and as I think about the uh, the, the way the proxy advisory firms present their services to us, uh, there's really three components of uh, that, that offering. The, the, the first is objective. Um, as I mentioned, we've got 3,800 companies in the U.S., each of which uh, issue a proxy statement that ranges on, at, at one extreme, Amazon's, Amazon's proxy statement was 25 pages. Uh, most people's compensation sections are more than 25 pages, but at, you know, at one extreme you've got Amazon at 25 pages, and at the other you've got proxy statements that are hundreds of pages long. And one of the key things that the proxy advisory firms do for us is consolidate and digest that information into a consistent, uh, consistent presentation so our analysts, as they're going through, can rapidly get to the issues uh, of, of primary importance to us. We always go to the, the proxy statement itself for, for further detail, but the, the, this objective, uh, factual presentation of uh, the, the issues is, is of critical administrative importance to us in getting through, uh, in getting through the volumes that we see, particularly given the, the concentration of uh, annual meetings in the U.S into the April-June window. This, the second level of service, or the second component of the service provided by the advisory firms is the subjective piece. The you know, interpretive overlay on those facts, applying their point of view um, or their guidelines to reach a voting conclusion based on, based on those facts. Um, we, we see that component of, of the reporting as, as a matter of course but it's, it's not determinative of our vote. It may inform at the margin. Um, it, may, it may flag items for deeper discovery by going back to, the, um, back to the proxy statement itself or other public documents or initiate a discussion with the company. 
um, but it's, it's not determinative. So we're not relying on the recommendations of proxy advisors to cast, to cast our votes. The third, um, third component really separate from the discussion today is um, both ISS and Glass-Lewis provide a voting platform, so a, 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 a process through which votes across a significant number of portfolios. In our case, um, we've got 200 plus individual accounts um, on which we need to vote, and they both, both offer voting platforms that, uh, again, provide administrative support for that, both from an execution standpoint and a reporting standpoint. Um, both offer services that support the, the vote disclosure on the back end. Um, so that's, but really for us, the, the primary use uh, is, is really that factual digestion of uh, 3,800 or 13,000 proxy statements so that our analysts can apply our guidelines uh, to, to, the votes, to the votes that we cast. Uh, do you ever explicitly take the position that you are following the recommendation of a proxy advisor? No. So um, are you taking the position that you do not have a conflict of interest in, in connection with any of these votes? No, I, I mean, we, we've often said that there, there are two, two kinds of companies that we own in our portfolio, clients and potential clients, mm -hmm. right? So you, you could take an argument at the extreme that we're potentially conflicted with every one of those votes. Uh, but as a, as a practical matter, we've separated both from a, an execution and an oversight standpoint, we've separated the vote execution analysis from the client side of our business. And so, that, so the proxy voting group that I described, these 12 to 15 analysts, live within, within our fund operations group. They have no visibility to, um, to our client relationships. And um, they, they vote on the basis of the guidelines and the facts that were presented in the context of our analysis. From an oversight standpoint, we have a senior executive group comprised of folks like our chief investment officer, our general counsel, uh, the, the fund's CFO, our corporate uh, CFO, me as the fund controller, um, again, none of whom have client-facing responsibilities. So, yeah, we have, um, we have clients whose stock we also own, but that, that never, never factors into the, um, to the decision-making process. And in fact, I've had, um, I, I, was, I was doing the rough math this morning, um, I've, I've been in the, the governance role for about the last 14 years. So, you know, roughly speaking, that equates to somewhere, somewhere north of 100,000 shareholder meetings that we voted at. Um, we, I've had the client card played three times, never from within the firm, um, always from the company itself, um, and that has never gone well for the company that played that card. Uh, now, obviously it was played given a knowledge that we were already against something that the, that the company was advocating for or for something the company was advocating against, um, but that's never played a factor in our voting. How much does it cost uh, for Vanguard, as far as you know, you're the controller after all. Um, how, how much does it cost the Vanguard funds to do your own analysis and develop your guidelines and your policies and so forth for voting? Is that a significant cost? And does it include, um, do you vote on everything? Or do you, uh, other than your perhaps the foreign voting, yeah. but here in the United States, do you vote on everything that's before the um, uh, before the, uh, uh, here in the voters, United States, the shareholders? We, we vote on practically everything. As, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a subset of proposals, typically environmental and social shareholder proposals, on which we abstain. Um, the, the rest of the portfolios we tend, I'm sorry, the rest of the proposals we tend to vote on. Um, I, I don't have a cost number to quote, um, but as I mentioned, it's 12 to 15 people out of our 14,000 14, 
uh, 14 or 15,000 global crew um, on a share on a on an asset base approaching three trillion dollars. Okay, Glenn, thank you very much. Uh, Jill, um, you've written some very influential and important papers based on your research concerning the power, the actual power, as you've been able to scope it out, of proxy advisors. What, what have you got to tell us about that? Uh, I mean, I'm taking a, pay, a paper that's 50 pages. You have to reduce it to five <laughs> I have minutes. I summarize it into a sound sure. bite. Um, I had a couple of slides. I don't know, Peter, if we can get yeah, them Yeah, they should be on there. That I don't know whether this is winked out or... <laughs> Probably timed out. Um, anyway, I, um, I think we have to be a little bit careful when we think about the influence of proxy advisors and this idea of outsourcing the vote. And we've looked at this in a couple of different ways and we're continuing to work in this area. Um, and all of this work is uh, co-authored with Steve Choi and Marcel Kahan at NYU. Um, first of all, the fact that institutional investors vote the same way as the ISS recommendation is not surprising. Uh, the vast majority of ISS recommendations are aligned with management. They're, they're recommending the same way. Management says, vote for our director candidates. ISS says, we support these director candidates. 93, 94% of the time, um, the ISS recommendation is aligned. So you're going to see a lot of alignment between the votes and the ISS recommendation, no matter what. Second, the factors that are driving the institutional vote are often exactly the same as the factors that are driving this ISS recommendation. Right? Take Vanguard's votes. Right? They're going to look for a director election, say. They're going to look at, well, did the director attend the majority of the board meetings? So was the director absent a lot? Um, is the director, does the director sit on too many boards? Does the director have conflicts that we're concerned about, independence? Right? Those are all things that factor into Vanguard's analysis. They also factor into the ISS recommendation. So when we started looking at this, what we did was we tried to control for these other factors. And you can find these other factors from the proxy statement the same way that Glenn does, the same way that Vanguard does. Um, and we found that when we controlled for the other factors, the proxy advisor's recommendations still mattered. Um, ISS's recommendation in particular seemed to influence the vote by a margin of 6 to 10 percent. That's a lot. That's pretty influential. But it's not the 25 or 30 or 35 percent that you hear in the newspaper and so forth. And I think that's up now on the, uh, on the, on the slide. Right? Um, so it's not that we necessarily see um, uh, ISS swinging the big votes. The second factor that you have to take into account is that there are two different types of recommendations. There are the recommendations that are aligned with management and the recommendations where ISS recommends against what management wants. And they have a very different level of influence. When ISS and, and management are on the same page, shareholders are too. Right? Those recommendations, and they're most of ISS's recommendations, they're not a problem in terms of moving the vote. But when ISS diverges from management, there is an effect, but institutional investors tend to be a lot more skeptical. Institutional investors are not blindly following, are not going along with ISS 100% of the time on those votes, whether it's a withhold recommendation or a recommendation to vote down a pay package or a recommendation that's against a management proposal, something like that. Right? And we found that when you look carefully, the number of mutual funds that outsource to ISS in the sense that they're following ISS 99% of the time, something like that, it may be a large number of funds, but in terms of assets under management, in terms of votes cast, the number is much smaller. In our sample, it was on the order of 3% of assets under management. And the reason that that number is so much smaller is because this outsourcing, to the extent it occurs, and it does occur, occurs primarily at the smaller institutional investors. 
right? The institutions that are commanding fewer votes are also relying more heavily on the proxy advisors. Why is that? It's not surprising, right? Uh, Glenn told you that Vanguard has a staff of 12 to 15 people doing this. He told you about the information demands of analyzing all of this. And Vanguard's a huge company. A small mutual fund company doesn't have the resources to put 12 to 15 people to work on this. BlackRock has, I think, 20 people uh, running their uh, uh, voting decisions. And if you're uh, voting shares at thousands of companies, thousands of annual meetings a year, a staff of 12 or 15 or 20 people, that's a pretty small staff. Now go to a mutual fund that's several orders of magnitude smaller, and you can imagine they're lucky if they can, if their corporate governance officer can take a look at this stuff for a few hours a week, right? They don't have uh, the bandwidth, and so you're going to see a level of reliance at those firms that's quite different. And that's, I think, the biggest concern when you think about moving away from the idea of outsourcing. I agree that the no action letters and this idea of conflicts of interest have kind of um, uh, corrupted what was the idea, the original idea behind um, Harvey's rule. And I think that informed, intelligent voting by institutional investors is absolutely the gold standard. But can you really expect a small institution to have the expertise, the resources to do this effectively? And I think back, um, Back when you were uh, 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 debating the rule, I was on a panel with Eric Reuter, who was then the uh, general counsel of Fidelity. And he said to me, you know, we don't want this rule. We don't want this responsibility. It wasn't that he was concerned, or maybe he was, but it wasn't that he was ex concerned primarily about liability. He was concerned about the fact that portfolio managers are stock pickers. They're not corporate governance experts. You can tell them they need to vote on all of these issues, but at the end of the day, they don't necessarily have the resources or the bandwidth to make good corporate governance decisions. And we all kind of take pot shots at the proxy advisors and say, oh, they're recommending things that are bad for corporations. They're bad for corporate America. But I'm not clear you'd get better decisions if we force the mutual funds to do this themselves. Hmm. Where are you on this question of um, the requirement of, for voting, of fiduciary duty of some kind to vote? Where, where, do you, where do you think that goes? Well, I don't think fiduciary duties get you much of anywhere, whether it's in shareholder voting or director responsibility or broker dealers or anything else. So I'm not a big fan of required fiduciary duties. Um, but I think this idea of requiring uh, mutual funds to vote is a kind of double-edged sword. We can sort of put aside the social policy issues and the political issues and say, well, they're not economically important. They're also not really expensive to vote. You know, it's not hard to analyze what your, what your policy is on, um, you know, employment practices in third world countries or uh, disclosure of political spending, and then to cast that vote across the board at all of these annual meetings. And whether uh, mutual funds rely on ISS in terms of analyzing what approach they should take when they formulate their guidelines, whether they rely on what they read in the newspaper, you know, at the end of the day, it's not a complicated process. Where voting is expensive is on the things that I think we agree are economically important. Um, you know, uh, mutual funds didn't really uh, demand this vote on executive compensation. But it's incredibly expensive to analyze. The information costs are huge. And at the end of the day, it could really matter. Director elections, which is the subject we studied, lots and lots of different variables that you might want to take into account. And we can say, well, gee, mutual funds don't have to do it. They shouldn't have a fiduciary duty to do it. Um, mutual funds, uh, institutional investors own 70% of big cap companies. If they don't vote, who's going to do it? Um, on this question, I think we have a little bit of time left, maybe a minute or so. So I'm wondering where you say uh, your, your study shows a, a lot of convergence between what the mutual funds do and what the recommendations are. And the, the conclusions you draw from that is that they really, the recommenders, the proxy advisors, are not that powerful. They're actually doing exactly what the mutual funds are doing anyway when they make these recommendations. Well, to what extent are the mutual funds conforming with, with 
with what they expect the proxy advisors to say so that they don't get into any kind of trouble. Well, here's, um, can you just click return on that and see if it advances? Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, I'm good. So, so here's an interesting slide um, that maybe partly answers this question, and I apologize that the print's a little small, but they told me I could only have one or two slides, so I had to squish. Um, but so one of the things, we studied, as I said, uh, director elections. And what people are worried about, what issuers are worried about in director elections isn't those 3% of the votes that are going along with ISS automatically. What they're worried about is a high withhold vote. You know, if uh, only 70% of the votes are in favor or only 60% of the votes are in favor of a director candidate, that director candidate is in trouble. So we looked at the relationship, the influence of ISS on high withhold votes. And we found that the influence of ISS wasn't critical. It mattered, right? You can see ISS withholds alone. It uh, increases your chance of a high withhold vote. But what really mattered, um, strangely enough, was ISS coupled with one of four additional factors. And you'll see in those additional factors, you see things like Fidelity's withhold vote or Vanguard's withhold vote. Um, so it turns out that you know, if you're thinking of kind of being in touch with the mind of the institutional investor, uh, the proxy advisors do a pretty good job. But the proxy advisors can't do it alone. And when they get it wrong, as you see kind of reflected, in the votes of Fidelity and Vanguard, you also see it reflected in the bottom line. The, when the proxy advisors get it wrong, the big institutional investors aren't going along, and the big votes aren't swinging that way. Well, thank you very much, Jill. We'll get back to you if we have some time and if there are questions from the audience. Damon, good to have you here. Um, I, I would assume that um, you are in favor of proxy advisors. Um, do you think they should be regulated in some way by the SEC? Well, um, let me start by saying that I, I'm not sure I'm in, am I in favor of proxy advisors. I'm not, I'm, I, I don't know. I don't think about it that way. I mean, I, I think that, um, uh, I mean, look, I, I, let, let's, let's start sort of from foundations. And those foundations have come up a couple times in this roundtable uh, already. But, I mean, the right to vote your shares uh, is clearly an asset. It is clearly part of the bundle of rights that you get when you buy a share of stock. And, and clearly, mutual funds, part of what mutual funds have, including the right to do other things. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a bundle that constitutes what a stock is, what a share of stock is. And um, not surprisingly, I think there's a general view among mutual funds, which are a kind of fiduciary, uh, that that right ought to be managed by people who are knowledgeable about it. It ought to be managed at an, at an expert level. I think uh, our friend from Vanguard didn't say that, but I think that's clearly what they do and what motivates the way they think about it. It's what the 15 people, I assume, are all about. Proxy advisory firms are a source of expertise, and as Jill laid out, um, some money, some mutual funds simply, as a matter of economies of scale, don't have the ability to bring that expertise in-house. Um, I'm, I'm very amused by the congressman's uh, hostility to outsourcing. I've got a long list of other outsourcing issues I want to raise with him now that I know he's so against outsourcing. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> but um, it's just common practice in investment management when you don't have the expertise in-house or you, you can't, uh, it's, not, um, uh, it's not economical to do it, uh, to, to, to outsource it, to, to hire expertise outside. Uh, and particularly to do so if you think that you have an unmanageable conflict. Uh, that's just standard operating procedure uh, across the investment management world. Now, I think that clearly, as in with other types of arrangements that are designed to bring into the corporate governance system objective, non-conflicted outside expertise, uh, there is uh, a problem of concentration, right, in the in the um, proxy advisory services. Uh, the congressman talked about this, a similar problem with credit rating agencies. Uh, he somehow omitted the one that has actually caused the most concern over the years, which is the problem with, with, uh, with auditors. Right? Uh, it's a quadrupoly, not a duopoly, but it's a long-standing serious, serious uh, issue. Uh, and if you understand the details, it's actually more serious than it appears. Uh, 
Um, so yes, there's a concentration issue with proxy advisory services, but it's not unique. Uh, and I suspect it's, its origins and intractability are similar to the origins and intractability of the issue with credit rating agencies and with, uh, and with uh, uh, auditors. Um, the, and then there is also, I think, a conflict issue, uh, but it hasn't come up here. Uh, and the conflict issue is, is that, is again very similar to the auditor conflict issue, uh, in that um, one of the two major proxy advisory firms, ISS, has a substantial consulting business where it takes money from, from the, uh, the, the companies that it, that it advises its clients on. Um, I, know I don't think that's appropriate. Um, I, I don't think it has, I don't know of any case where it's infected ISS. I can't point to something, but I don't think it's the way they ought to do business. I also think it's fairly obvious that the proxy advisory services are engaged in the business of providing investment advice. And in some cases, uh, we've talked about this, that they're in the business of providing investment advice where they are totally relied upon. There's not a discretionary function at the client level. Now, interestingly enough, one of the two major firms is registered as an investment advisor. Uh, it's the opposite of the conflicts issue. Uh, in this case, uh, Glass-Lewis is registered and ISS is not. Um, seems to me ISS ought to be registered. Uh, now, these are sort of modest things, I think. I mean, the, the conflicts thing, I think, from ISS's perspective is not modest. Or for whatever reason, they're quite devoted to it. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> but um, I, but I don't see these as profound structural things. Um, I, I think that to some extent, and I'll wrap on this point, the corporate community seems to be hoping in some way through this discussion of proxy advisory services to fundamentally undo a serious change that happened in American corporate governance over the last 25, 30 years, which is you know, the rise of institutional investors that act independently in the corporate governance system. And... Um, this business of trying to get, suggesting that maybe they ought not, that institu institutions maybe ought not to vote in some circumstances has this feel to it. I, I just observed, my view is, is that, um, you know, you can lie, let, you can not vote. It, I don't think there's a fiduciary problem with not voting as long as you've got a good reason, right, for not voting. Uh, if, if you want to let an asset lie fallow, uh, I suppose you can do it, but you've got to, you got to show that, that you have good reason. Um, you can't just say, well, as a general matter, we just don't exercise, we, don't, we just don't make use of this asset. I think that doesn't work. Um, and I don't think there's anything that anyone has done at the SEC or any place else that really calls that into question, um, that, that, that idea. But I think that, you know, there's been some talk here about unintended consequences. I suggested a corporate community that urging folks like Vanguard not to participate in the process may have unintended consequences that the corporate community may not like uh, at all. Um, and by the way, I, and I'll just conclude by saying I think that you've heard from Vanguard, um, you know, they're not making the decisions I would make, but they're making the decisions I would, they're making the kinds of decisions that I think um, we would, the, the AFL-CIO as a kind of monitor of our members' pension funds, we would expect to have them have processes of the kind they have. And I think the wisdom, by the way, of the underlying proxy, uh, the underlying proxy voting disclosure rule that Harvey talked about at the beginning is that the check on what Vanguard is doing is, is that Vanguard's investors, like me, I'm a Vanguard customer, uh, we know what they're doing. And if we're really unhappy, we have various ways of acting about that. Um, so I, I, I don't feel like this is like a, uh, uh, despite, the, despite the fact that I have some specific concerns that I've laid out, um, I don't think this system is broken uh, at all. In fact, I think it works relatively well. What about the issue of uh, whether a particular vote is on a matter that doesn't have any um, monetary economic effect on the shareholders? Do you think that that is appropriate for uh, proxy advisors to be involved in? Is that a, there's no conflict of interest here? Um, simply a question, we'll say, climate change. Um, or maybe it's called global warming. I have no idea. It's a hot day, so it's probably global warming today. But the, but the, the question is, is this something that you think proxy advisors should weigh in on and, the, and uh, mutual fund uh, managers should pay attention to? Well, 
Peter, I, I would say uh, this, that um, what constitutes, the whole nature of, and, and this, is a, this opens up a larger point that I think is really important. Investment management expertise at whatever level you, you look for it, right, whether you're looking for it uh, with the, the, the primary advisor to a mutual fund or a, a registered investment advisor dealing directly with clients, or whatever, wherever you find investment management expertise. Our securities laws and our pension laws, every statutory body, the body of regulation we have around investment management, uh, as taken as a generic term, uh, does not expect the investment manager and does not hold the investment manager accountable to get it right. right? That's not the standard. Right? The notion that we all understand that investment management is a business of taking risks and that sometimes they get it wrong. You're not legally liable for making a mistake. You're legally liable for not exercising due care, for having conflicts of interest, uh, and the like. Proxy voting is a subset of investment management and ought to be subject to that type of regime. Right? There ought not to be a kind of gutcher system where the expectation is, is that in this area alone you have to get it right or you will have a legal problem. Now, <clears throat> the question of what, a share, what shareholder proposals have or what matters, I think the better way to put it this is the question of what matters that come before an annual meeting have economic consequence is in, the, is in the eye of the beholder. I think there are certain matters that it's quite obvious have large economic consequences. Uh, the, you know, an, an M&A transaction, for example, is I think indisputably of great economic consequence. Jill just said that executive pay is a, a matter of great economic consequence. I, I strongly agree, and I think there's a growing consensus, particularly after the financial crisis, that this is true. But over the years I've been involved in this issue, I've heard many people say it doesn't matter at all. Uh, and so there's, it's a matter of d debate. I can certainly, we could certainly fill a room of people who would object very strenuously, Peter, to your notion that, that climate issues aren't of economic consequence. I don't think we have to answer those questions. I think the point of the system is whatever's coming in, the, the, the fiduciaries have to look at, the proxy voting services have to look at. There's nothing stopping a proxy voting service from saying, hey, this issue doesn't matter. You know, if a proxy voting service believes that, I don't see any reason why they can't say that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Peter, if I can just interject, Please. there's um, another SEC rule, um, which is now the subject of a uh, petition for uh, amendment of the rule um, on resubmissions, because I, I think the, the point um, Damon makes is a good one, that is, in the eyes of different beholders, you may have different reactions, but there's a resubmission uh, policy that the SEC says, which um, interpreted in its most pragmatic way, says that as long as a proposal is not rejected by more than 90 percent of shareholders, it can keep being resubmitted year after year after year. And of course, as fiduciaries, people have to take another look every year. Um, there was a proposal uh, in the early 90s to change this rule so that higher thresholds would have to be made. But one of the things that's encumbering portfolio managers is simply the uh, massive number of proposals. And this is a way in which some proposals could be eliminated from, from the process. Um, and it remains to be seen whether the SEC will act on this petition, but it's, um, it's a serious problem for portfolio managers. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Alex, uh, Congressman McHenry talked about the uh, rating agencies issue and what the SEC has inadvertently done to kind of give them a patina of government backing. Do you see the same issue here with proxy advisors, and how would you deal with it? Thank you, uh, Peter. I do indeed, uh, and as the congressman said, I think the SEC staff, not the board, Harvey, the staff made exactly the same mistake with these proxy advisors that it previously made uh, with credit rating agencies, which was also a staff no action letter uh, affair. Only it's worse in the case of proxy advisors, and I'll mention why uh, in a minute. It's my view that the SEC uh, staff or board 
should not sanctify anybody's subjective opinions of outsiders. Uh, everybody, as has been pointed out, has conflicts of interest. Damon, on the uh, ISS in particular, you said, why are they so wedded to this idea? Well, it's a money-making idea, of course. If, if, I can, if I can advise you on how to get a better rating from me and you'll pay me for it. Um, but I'm not opposed to anybody putting out opinions and publishing, publishing them if they want to, and anybody, shareholders or agents for shareholders like Vanguard, if they want to use those opinions, that's, that's fine. But I am opposed for any special status being given to any such opinions uh, by, the, uh, by the SEC. So uh, if proxy advisors want to run around uh, developing uh, uh, subjective or ideological opinions on corporate governance matters, that's fine. But those opinions shouldn't have any more weight than, uh, than anybody else's opinions. So as Congressman McHenry said, I think an excellent uh, first step uh, would be to remove the uh, no action letters and just get rid of them that we've been uh, talking about. Furthermore, I would say if there are uh, institutional investors, and Harvey said it's 25% of them who explicitly as a policy depend on outside opinions, this should be viewed as a strong negative on their own management. So be fine to buy the opinions and make use of them, but if, but if your policy is to follow them in some slavish way, well, you should be viewed as irresponsible uh, to that effect, uh, not responsible. And I say this, I said the uh, proxy advisor case is worse than the credit rating agency, but for all of the uh, undeserved AAA ratings uh, that credit rating agencies uh, gave uh, mortgage-backed securities. Under a credit rating, there is actually knowledge about, and maybe you make mistakes, but there is knowledge about cash flows and the extents of defaults, which would be required to uh, penetrate the various levels of a subordinated structure. But in, uh, in the contentious part, I mean, not the sort of ordinary, well, we'll vote for most of the directors part, but the contentious part of this, these are, uh, as Glenn said, subjective, and uh, these agencies do have ideological, or you could call them philosophical or theoretical ideas. Well, that's, that's fine, and they're the same as everybody else's ideas. And they, they may be good or they, they may be bad. So overall, I think that uh, on the proxy advisors, we should take the same position that the Dodd-Frank Act took on credit rating agencies. Not a big fan of Dodd-Frank in general, uh, but Dodd-Frank uh, did say something good. It said, well, regulators, you're not allowed to require or to sanctify outside advisors. In fact, you can't even mention them in your regulations. I'd say we should apply that to proxy advisors uh, as well. If I could just have one more minute. You may. Peter, there's, there's something behind this that's, uh, that's a bigger issue. Uh, and that is, as people have uh, pointed out, a very large proportion of equities, especially of large companies, are held in institutional form. Uh, these are, that is to say, they are held by agents, agents for the ultimate shareholders. Uh, and these agents masquerade as shareholders, and they often give speeches talking about themselves as shareholders, but they're not shareholders, they're, they're agents. Uh, and this is a bigger issue. I call it agency capitalism. I wrote a paper a couple of years ago called Will the Real Shareholders Please Stand Up? Uh, distinguishing uh, the change in the American capital markets from a system in which shareholders were held actually by shareholders to which shares were held and manipulated by agents of various kinds, like, for example, union pension funds, uh, Damon and Vanguard, and others. And I don't think, as a, as a society, we've really figured out how to deal with the bigger issues uh, of this agency capitalism. Uh, and where does someone who is a real shareholder, say like me, uh, fit into this? Uh, one of the things the SEC has done is to disenfranchise real shareholders, like me, who have shares in brokers' accounts held in street name. Now, I would like to be able, if I chose, uh, to tell my broker that he could vote my shares the same way Vanguard would vote the shares in a mutual fund. 
but I'm disenfranchised and unable to do that. Uh, final point, both Jill and Damon talked about do people know enough? Can you, can you know enough about corporations and corporate governance to vote? Well, I didn't know that knowledge was required for voting. I mean, think of a real shareholder, an individual real shareholder. Do we say that he should not be able to vote if he's not a, uh, an expert to somehow in corporate governance? Well, of course not. So this is all, I think, part of the bigger issue that we're struggling with as a society uh, when we deal with agency capitalism. But as a, uh, as a first point, Let's get rid of the no action letters. Second point, put a Dodd-Frank-like prohibition on the regulatory agencies from uh, favoring uh, or even mentioning such proxy advisors. Uh, and then we can work on these bigger issues. Alex, thank you very much. Um, well, I think we've come to the point where we can ask for audience questions. You've heard some very stimulating remarks from this remarkable panel. So uh, let's one way in the back, and would you just identify yourself and ask a question? Okay. Thank my name is Bonnie Wachtel, and I'm here today in my capacity as a corporate director. So I'm going to address this question to, to Jill in terms of the research that you've done. I'd like to see another study done with respect to uh, the power of the proxy advisors. And that study would be either the cost or the perceived cost of having a fight with ISS, even if you win, because I did not get any sense from your remarks about the chilling effect from ISS laying down policies, things like how many women you should have on the board and what you know, all of their little corporate governance undertones to not comply if you think potentially, even if you win, particularly the first round, that, uh, you know, potentially you're going to invite an activist, you might upend the whole board. And if I could have another 30 seconds, I would like to give an example of an ISS horror story that goes directly to the issue of raising capital. And that is, I sit on a board uh, that is an emerging growth company. Emerging growth companies are not, you know, the ma one of the major requirements that they get a five-year window on is you don't have to have the internal controls uh, with an auditor's opinion. Uh, this company put right in its perspective, it would take a couple of years to do that, but that did not stop ISS from re recommending a withhold vote for the audit committee we had to, you know, the general counsel, we had to fire, file more papers, spend a day calling 16 different institutions, only four of which would even read the material. Fortunately, they managed to pull the vote on, and I won't extend this question any longer, but for the next panel, I have some comments about how they do compensation. So could you answer the first piece about this, of looking at even if the system as a whole could withstand this, the 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 hidden costs and the cost to, you might say, the most vulnerable companies, including small ones that are supposed to be given some leeway? Thank you, it's a great question. Um, and I think you're right. There are huge costs to not just engaging with ISS, but engaging with the investors who are asking questions, who are saying, well, ISS, has set out this policy about term limits for directors and what should we do about it? Or ISS is recommending auditor rotation that goes beyond what the accounting rules require. Um, but I think Damon's right. To a certain extent, um, we're in a different place with respect to institutional activism than we were 20 years ago. And you can't put the genie back in the bottle. The SEC rule, in part, was a response to the fact that mutual funds and other institutional investors were viewed as voting lockstep with management. Lockstep with management either because it was too expensive, because they wasn't, weren't informed, because they didn't want to be bothered, or because they had their own conflicts of interest. We're not going to go back to that world. On the retail side, until recently, we had discretionary broker voting. So the retail vote was something you could count on, again, as going along with management. We don't have that today. And that means that issuers and 
directors and corporate governance officers have to deal with these policies, have to deal with these questions a lot more frequently, and it's going to come out in the ultimate vote. Um, whether you think that's good or bad, I mean, that kind of uh, goes beyond the scope of our panel. But I don't think you can lay responsibility for that wholly at the feet of the proxy advisors. Some of the things that the proxy advisors recommend are silly ideas. And yes, it's a waste of time for directors to have to engage. But the thing about a lot of these proposals is you don't always know at the time whether it's a silly idea. And academic research can't always tell you it's a good idea, it's socially valuable to structure your pay in this way or to separate the chairman and CEO positions or to set 10-year director term limits. We can't always answer those questions. So ISS puts them out there, and sometimes they fall on their face, and sometimes the institutional community goes along. I mean, we're still having the debate about poison pills and staggered boards after air gas and air products, right? And, you know, we know the position of almost all of the institutional investors on that issue, but, you know, now there's this argument, well, you know, didn't it save one company, and maybe it's a better idea than everybody thought. Um, you know, I don't think that's the fault of the proxy advisors. No, it's the fault of the institutions for following them, but that's basically the fault of the SEC and the Thank you very much. Um, another question. We have time for one more question. Uh, Seth Yarkoni from the office, uh, Senator Mark Kirk. I was just wondering, would, would legislation itself have unintended cons consequences? Or have there been any studies on, like, the cost of the proxy services and how it might hurt like these smaller mutual fund holders, these companies that aren't Vanguard, Fidelity, et cetera, if they can't function to, uh, if, if they're like open to liability from that so they can't hold these things and there's consolidation in the industry itself that creates other conflicts of interest, et cetera, for, if the government were to go after. Uh, Can we do that? Damon? And then Alex. Yeah. Um, I think there is an issue here that if you that if you basically say to the smaller mutual funds that you've got the following choices, you can either uh, incur a substantial in-house expense that you don't have $3 trillion of assets to spread over, or you can simply, uh, you can not vote and tell, your, and, tell your, uh, and tell your investors you're not voting and compete on that basis with the Vanguard and the Fidelity who are voting. Uh, it's not clear to me that's good for small for small funds. And I think this raises a larger issue that Alex's comments kind of touched on and a couple of other people's comments touched on. It's undoubtedly true that I, as an individual investor acting for myself, can do whatever crazy thing I want with the, with the proxies that come to me. I can, I can shred them. I can vote them in the smartest, most financially uh, informed way possible. I can them ran. I can use a dartboard. I can uh, I can vote them in the in the pursuit of whatever re religious or ideological things make me happy. I can do anything with my thing, uh, and I don't have to have any expertise. Absolutely true. But we're having a conversation about in about about investment management on behalf of other people, and in that world, and again, it doesn't really matter which of the various regulatory regimes govern the various forms of investment management. But in the world of investment management of other people's money. Right, in the world that I think uh, uh, that Alex is a little concerned about, and I think the, the agency issues are real serious ones. In that world, you've, if, if you're going to manage the asset of somebody else, you've got to use expertise. Right? It's just a fundamental fact about the way investment management must work. Right? And that's got to apply to proxy voting, in my opinion. And uh, the, the, um, that, uh, well, let me just stop there. I've used up enough time. Alex? You, you just avoided that. <laughs> that was really smart. Uh, uh, that they, point. <laughs> uh, Damon and I agree on the importance of this uh, divide. If, as a uh, agent for somebody else, you have to follow a prudent man rule. So the, to answer the question, uh, if you didn't have a special blessing from the SEC, that doesn't stop from anybody from wanting to be in the business of publishing opinions about how you should vote. And if they can talk somebody into buying their opinions, more power to them. Uh, but they shouldn't have any special blessing or special haven or safe harbor for using those issues. They ought to stand or fall on their own. And from the point of view of a fund, the fund can decide 
to use them or whatnot, but it shouldn't get any uh, special uh, blessing or protection. It, it should have to follow a prudent man rule as agent for its beneficial uh, owners, uh, and we, and that's it. And so you have a market working. Well, I think we've come to the end of this panel. You have another panel coming up which will deal with some of the same issues from perhaps a different perspective, but we've, this has been a wonderful panel and uh, we've been lucky to be able to assemble people with such knowledge. So would you please join me in giving them a hand? Thank you, Peter. Would the next panel come on up? Okay, the new name plates are coming. Don't worry. You, you can just sit down and we'll, we'll move a name plate to you. Don't worry. wherever they uh, put your <laughs> put your name plate Paul Allen Robert Steve and Hester I don't know where you are Hester there you go okay good um, I know that some people are taking a break and that's okay but we did, we don't have that much time so I'm gonna get started right away so I'm uh, Jim Glassman again. One thing I neglected to say is that I'm also, uh, like Damon Silvers, a member of the SEC's Investor Advisory Committee, and also, like Damon, a member of its Investor as Owner Subcommittee, which is uh, taking up these very issues right now, as is the SEC, as apparently is, is uh, the U.S. Congress. So. Um, you, you all have uh, bios of the distinguished panelists, but I'll just do this very quickly. We have two former commissioners of the SEC, Steve Wallman and Paul Atkins. Uh, we have Alan McCall, who's a distinguished academic in this field from Stanford. Um, we have Robert McCormick, who's an official at Glass-Lewis, and I, I want to correct the record, I know Damon kind of misspoke when he said that ISS is, Glass-Lewis is a registered investment advisor, ISS is not, actually it's the opposite, right? You are not, ISS is, which is an issue we, we may want to get into. Esther Pierce is, uh, is my uh, collaborator um, on an update of a paper that I wrote with uh, one of her former colleagues, J.W. Verrett, which uh, Mercatus is publishing this week, and I think we've got uh, we have copies outside, even though I think the actual publication date's not till next week, but that's all right. 
Oh, it's today. Oh, okay, great. So there it is. We we didn't we didn't beat ourselves to the punch. Um, so thanks all of you, and we're gonna we're gonna use the same uh, format that Peter so ably directed in the first panel. Um, thank you. So I want to. I actually want to go to Steve first, and I know that w one of the questions I want to ask Steve is about exactly what these regulations would look like if we ch if we if we change things. But before we get to that, we are very lucky because uh, Steve Wallman is not only former commissioner of the SEC, he is also the founder and CEO of Folio FN, uh, and he's also the founder of an organization called Proxy Government Governance, on whose board I, advisory board I, I once sat, and Proxy Governance is no more, and it entered this this very field and uh, and did not survive. And so uh, there's been a lot of talk today about this duopoly. It's not exactly a duopoly. There are others in the area in the, in the field, but there's, it really is dominated by two firms, and especially by one firm. Can you just tell me, Steve? why things didn't work out for proxy governance? What, what, what is the nature of this market? I think the, um, the issues about uh, PGI and uh, why it didn't or didn't work um, uh, in various ways are, are complicated. I think the, the broader-based issue, perhaps, is the more fundamental one of why is it that we have proxy advisory firms in the first instance, and are they providing useful service? I was a little bit confused, perhaps, by, by some of the, the panel before us on what the actual question is that I think people are trying to resolve. Uh, there was, at one point, an issue of whether or not there is some kind of conflict of interest that needs to be regulated. Uh, there's the second question of, are they useful? There's a third question of, do people follow them anyway? There's a fourth question of, are they smart in terms of what they're doing and leading different kinds of thought processes in corporate governance? Um, I'm not sure any of those are particularly useful questions to necessarily have a panel debate uh, because I think it changes over time. Um, they have been more useful at various times and less useful at other times. Uh, some of their vote recommendations are, I think, quite thoughtful and well received and uh, very well researched. Others are perhaps less so. Uh, I think the real question, though, is what kind of regulatory structure have we put in place that requires certain things that may not be what we think is the right outcome or the best outcome? And you heard a little bit of that earlier with the question of, uh, is there a market solution for all this? And why is it that we have a duopoly? The, the easy answer, I think, is pretty clear. We've put in place a regulatory structure, which, by the way, I was a great supporter of and fan of uh, a number of years ago as well. But my mind has uh, changed somewhat over the years in terms of better understanding unintended consequences. I think once you become a regulator no more and you actually start to go into the real world and actually do things, you start to see how all the best of intentions aren't necessarily going to be the best of results. Uh, and what uh, we discovered was, and PGI discovered this as well, for an awful lot of folks, they use the proxy compliance firms as, in essence, a compliance shield, an insurance, if you will. And it is much, much less expensive to pay 15000 20000 25000 a year or less in some cases and more in other cases, much more in other cases. To have a proxy advisor firm that can give you answers to all of the things that are put before you so that you're insulated from the question of whether or not, in fact, you voted appropriately. Because after all, if you're following ISS's recommendation or Glass Lewis's recommendation, it's not going to be expected, it's not going to be reasonable for someone to go out and sue you for a breach of duty. It's just not going to happen. And so what does occur is that if you're a smaller firm and if you have a regulatory structure that seems to imply that you need to at least look at every one of the thousands of votes put in front of you, there is no question that outsourcing is the only thing that makes any economic sense. It doesn't matter whether you take it out of the rules. It doesn't matter whether you rescind the no action letters. It's just not going to matter. There is no intelligent mutual fund, no thoughtful investment advisor that's going to sit there and say, my choice is I either hire 15 internal people who will barely be able to really keep up and understand what's going on without, in any event, hiring an outside firm to give us the data, to give us the information, to distill it down, to put it into a mechanism so we can actually look at it one by one. 
or I can simply outsource it to that firm in the first place and just have them do it all. And yes, if they bring something to my attention or if I have a particular view on a particular matter, I may decide to vote against what they're recommending, but generally speaking, I'm going with them. That is the only economically rational way for someone to approach this issue. If you get big enough, as Vanguard is, as T. Rowe Price is, as BlackRock is, et cetera, you can have internal people as well. But to expect that if you have a rule that seems to imply that you must vote, or at least look at everything that you must vote. And the notion, for example, of saying, well, you don't actually have to vote. You can make a decision to abstain on a particular matter. Well, but you have to analyze something to decide whether or not you're going to make a decision to abstain on a particular matter. That's actually much more expensive than just voting on it to begin with. So having the ability to say, I'm going to abstain on these matters versus just simply voting on them and versus all that, just simply outsourcing it, there's only one choice. And so you end up with proxy advisory firms because of the way the structure is. With regard to why there are two of them, look at it this way. How many different areas can you get to have votes on, right? Most of them are for or against. You've got two choices. You don't have a lot of additional things that people are going to come out with. There will be minor changes and variations in terms of thresholds that people will have. Glass-Lewis has certain thresholds. ISS has other thresholds. The thresholds are not that controversial at the end of the day. They're not that big a deal. There's just not a lot of reason to have five or 10 or 15 people out there competing on this. And so you end up with sort of a natural expectation. You'll end up with a couple. Maybe there would be room for three, maybe not. Seems like there's more likely room for two. At some point, you end up with large institutions willing to pay, and those are the ones that support Glass-Lewis and ISS at a major way. The little guys are out there just looking for insurance, and they'll go with whoever's cheapest. It's hard to run a business if that's what you're, you're actually trying to build up. I think, as usual, Steve, you've gotten to the heart of the matter that um, outsourcing makes economic sense because ultimately uh, these corporate governance decisions are supposed to enhance shareholder value, at least I think they are. Um, so it's really not necessarily in the best interest of the institutions to spend a lot of money, a lot of resources on making these decisions. There's an interesting uh, quote that uh, Hester has in our paper, I say Hester because she's the one who found it, uh, from the Department of Labor that says, and it paraphrases in the beginning, but then it becomes a quote, if a fiduciary charged with voting its client's shares determines that the costs of voting outweigh its economic benefits, uh, the economic benefits for the client, the fiduciary, quote, has an obligation to refrain from voting. Wouldn't that mean, Steve, that the fiduciary has kind of has an obligation to refrain from voting, period? No. The, um, uh, you know, again, when you look at it from this perspective, it's pretty straightforward. You pay money to a Glass-Lewis or an ISS. Let's assume it costs you $25,000. They will give you a vote recommendation on almost everything. ISS won't, I think, on MISCU, but I think other than that, they'll give a recommendation on everything. Um, and so you're in a position where making a decision that says, I am going to individually look at any particular vote and decide not to vote it because it is less expensive for me not to vote it when I already have the recommendation from somebody else who's already told me how to vote. I, I, I'm sure that there are some academics somewhere who can come up with a mechanism for figuring out how that could work, but I think that's even beyond Jill. I, I don't think anyone is going to be able to make that kind of rational decision. It's just too expensive to decide not to vote when you've already paid to get a recommendation on everything that there is to vote. I think the, the solution to this is a little bit different. I think if you make everything important, nothing becomes important. And it makes sense just to outsource everything. In order to have a real solution to this, you need to change what it is that you're requiring people, in essence, either explicitly or implicitly to vote on. The way to do that isn't by saying you still have to look at everything and then decide whether or not to vote or not vote on it, because that's the same as saying that they look at everything. What you have to do is put in place a different rule. You need to have something that says, for example, if you own more than X hundreds of millions of a company stock or 100 million, whatever threshold you want, or if it's more than 1% or 2% of your portfolio, then yes, that you have to vote on. Everything else, we explicitly are telling you you don't have to vote on. And the problem with the securities laws, which is a much bigger issue than this panel, is that they no longer are principles-based. They're no longer securities laws that basically say, do the right thing, and as long as you are well-intentioned and you've thought it out, it's okay. Securities laws now have been check the box. They're very much rules-based. They're very much, 
you must do these things. And if you don't, you will be potentially liable for it, whether it's a third party suing, whether it's the SEC. And so you're in a position where unless you explicitly give people relief, unless you explicitly say you only need to look at these votes, these companies, this size, this part of your portfolio, you're back to the same role you've got now. Um, I, I want to get to Paul next, but before I do that, I, I wonder if Alan might have uh, a comment just based on, on your research or your impressions uh, on what Steve is saying about this kind of economic threshold that, well, that ultimately the problem is that, you know, the institutions don't really care. They don't really care how they, how they vote because it doesn't actually, their votes really, except in, in very limited cases, don't really affect shareholder value, which is what their customers care about. Can I just say, actually, it's not what I'm saying. So it's a good question, <laughs> but it's not mine. So, uh, I'm, I'm not but you can they, answer it anyway. I'm not saying All right, they don't, go ahead. They don't Tell care. me what you're saying. I'm not saying they don't care or do care. I think there are some institutions. I think Vanguard is a great example. I think T. Rowe is another one. BlackRock is probably another one. Fidelity is another one. I think there are hundreds. And then you go to the CalPERS, the CalSTRS, and others as well that care desperately about these issues sincerely want them to be right, do analyze them, have people inside that are true experts and that spend a lot of time on it, and they are quite intense in their views on a number of these topics. But, and Steve, they don't, when you say they spend a lot of time on it, I mean, you know, with all due respect to Glenn, he's got, Vanguard has 15 people out of 14,000 working on this. They've got 10,000 companies they have to look at well, every year. Well, they also year have all of ISS and Glass-Lewis giving them information and other things that they use to start with the analysis. And remember... But they wouldn't Jill have 15 is, people working on making, making buying said, and selling decisions on 15,000 Remember, 15, as Jill has stock. said, 95% of the issues actually aren't controversial. You don't need to spend a lot of time analyzing them. It's the 5% that become the issues that are worth spending time on. And so I think you do have some large institutional investors that do actually care. I think what we're talking about is, is there a, a rule here that's creating a problem? Is there a systemic issue in how the SEC is either put in place rules or the DOL or both that's creating something that we think is not right. If on the other hand the proxy advisors are serving a useful purpose, is if they're actually providing great research and really deep thinking, people who care about it will pay for them. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. So answer either my question or uh, my interpretation of what Steve had to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess from our perspective, looking at the data, looking at voting patterns, and, uh, you know, the, the shareholder voting is a, it has a classic free rider problem, where a given institution may own a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Um, you know, the amount of resource that they want to invest into voting that is, is pretty limited, because the likelihood that they're going to change the outcome of any given vote is very small, and yet they would absorb... Uh, and so their expected value from doing that is, is often infinitesimally small. And on the other hand, they would absorb the cost of, of doing that research. So, you know, outsourcing becomes a, a very viable solution in that sort of setting. And I think economically, you certainly would expect outsourcing to arise uh, because they don't have any incentive to do that sort of research in-house. And they can't probably, as a practical matter, do it economically. Um, okay, so Paul... And, and we're kind of going back to the initial question that was addressed to Harvey Pitt, but I want to get your perspective. So you were a, an SEC commissioner, and you dissented from the 2003 rule. In fact, I think it was the first time you ever dissented from any, uh, any, any rule as an SEC commissioner. You were loyal to your chairman, I guess. Um, so uh, and everyone seems to acknowledge that the rule was motivated you know, by good intentions, um, but uh, the effects were, were quite different. So can you just, just give us a perspective on your, your position and then what, what may or may not have changed over the years? Oh, yeah, well, thanks. Uh, well, first of all, I'm sorry I missed uh, that beginning of the uh, last panel because I just flew in from New York. But anyway, um, but, yeah, you're right. That was the first of a, a, a few no's that I uh, made, and I'd have to say I'd vote them all that way again. I wouldn't say necessarily the same about some of my yays, but uh, anyway. Um, the, the 
genesis of it, uh, as probably Harvey discussed, um, from what I remember, was Deutsche Bank, uh, their asset management uh, group, apparently supposedly switched their votes from one t uh, way to another in a big merger, um, HP Compaq, I believe it was. And so there was... Oh, we didn't know that, that part. Oh, you didn't know that. Okay. No. So there was an allegation, and there was an SEC enforcement action um, uh, in that regard of that uh, there was uh, some undue influence by investment bankers um, on the asset managers. So I think that was the uh, impetus of it. But, you know, the trouble is, um, you know, the, the wording of the rule and it's, um, you know, delving into this uh, really, you know, of course, I don't think came out uh, right way. And um, it, it created what we're talking about here with respect to the proxy advisory firms. And so I'm hoping that maybe even this week, the SEC will come out with some guidance uh, with respect to um, the use of proxy advisors and, uh, and their role. Um, but even if that comes out, it depends what it says. Part of the problem, I think, is with the rule itself. Um, because it's kind of sloppy in, um, as I went back and looked at it um, in its wording, because it talks about the duty that the advisor owes um, to the fund, which of course it does, um, the fund is the client um, under the Advisors Act. But there's one line that is very troubling, um, and I think uh, has some lawyers uh, concerned, but it says here, and it, quote, an investment advisor voting proxies on behalf of a fund, therefore, must do so in a manner consistent with the best interests of the fund and its shareholders. So what does that mean? I mean, we can understand what the fund is, but when you start looking at what the shareholders are, and so then that drives some people uh, to the feeling that they have to, um, you know, take on an outside advisor to um, be able to say what's in the best interest of the shareholders. So I think that's wrong as a matter of law. I don't think that the advisor owns owes a duty to the shareholders, it owes a duty to the fund as the client. But unfortunately, that's a very sloppy wording in that rule. But anyway, uh, at Can the I just interrupt you for a second? Because just, I know you weren't here, so, so uh, and Harvey can interpret um, or state on his own, but my notes say that the original rule actually made two points, which was uh, it required funds to have defined policies right. on voting, and then 60 to 90 days afterwards, uh, after a vote, it had to um, tell the shareholders how it voted. So that, that seems to be pretty straightforward and, and doesn't really involve what you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, but so anyway, but this is what the subject of why people are dri uh, being driven to the advisors. So that's one aspect. That, but then the, uh, there were a few other aspects that I remember uh, protesting about. One was the what I viewed as the potential politicization of the whole thing. And in fact, I found here uh, a Mercer Bullard quote. He's a professor at the University of uh, Mississippi, who's a good guy, but anyway, here he was quoted in a, in a particular journal, quote, the politicization argument does not hold water because portfolio managers are obligated to ignore special interest groups when voting proxies, he said. Well, the trouble is, you know, with all due respect to um, colleague here on the panel, I think that these proxy advisors are captured by the special interests. And the trouble, and we've seen over time now an incredible growth of so-called precatory proposals. These are ones that, unlike in the HP compact thing, their bylaw, the shareholders need to vote on a merger. Now we've seen, uh, we obviously still have those, but now we've seen a growth of really, I think, meaningless types of um, uh, precatory proposals, precatory meaning it just is an advisory vote, it has carries no weight. But because of uh, some of these advisory firms that basically say if a, um, a particular um, uh, uh, proposal garner a um, majority and the board doesn't take action on it, whatever that means, then the next year the advisor may um, recommend a no vote against the directors. And we see this happen over and over um, by these advisory firms. And oftentimes, because there is no transparency and there is no due process with respect to the process of these um, recommendations being formulated, oftentimes companies find that, that those advisory, those recommendations are predicated on incorrect information uh, that um, is uh, buried in the analysis of the advisory firms and only later on uh, does a company find out after um, after the fact? So, actually, on some of these things, like Seonpei, which is another precatory proposal, um, I'd like to see actually a lawsuit launched by a company or 
um, an affected individual, in the case of Salem Pay, against the advisory firm that uh, you know has incorrect information, and uh, that'd be interesting to see how it turns out. But ultimately, when Jill, I think on the last panel, I heard her say that we can't go back to the Wall Street rule. I think we can, actually, with respect to precatory proposals, because if it's a waste of time to vote, it has no effect. Why should a fund manager either pay an advisor to tell them how to vote or you know, pay employees to figure out how to vote uh, something like that? And I could go, I have tons of stories about um, some of these politicized uh, um, uh, activists, um, shareholders, who, like the current, uh, the most um, prolific uh, proposal this year has to do with disclosure of immaterial information, basically how companies uh, spend um, uh, money on political advocacy. And these things never pass. ISS and Glass-Lewis tend to vote, advise people to vote for them. Um, but most um, of the, the largest uh, investment managers have policies to vote against these sorts of things. But yet these things garner um, basically ISS or Glass-Lewis um, votes when they control 18 to you know, 30 some percent of some companies. Um, but other than that, they don't get voted um, in favor by uh, uh, real um, investment managers. So anyway, so there are a lot of other examples like that, but I don't want to hog the time. Okay, so I'm definitely going to turn to Robert McCormick next because Paul Atkins wants to sue him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, so among the, among the things that Paul just said is that these precatory votes, uh, say on pay, has kind of morphed because of proxy advisory services into uh, not just, hey, here's what our opinion is, but you better do this or we're going to vote out your board. Um, he says that proxy advisors are captured by special interests. I think that's something interesting to pursue. So I, I, my, my question, you can respond to those two things, but my, my question to you, though, Robert, is a kind of a more basic one, which is how do you make your decisions? Uh, wh what's the goal of a decision that um, – that Glass Lewis makes? What are you trying to do? The goal is to empower our clients with information so they can make informed voting decisions on all the issues that they get to vote on. Most of our clients, um, in terms of numbers, and certainly by assets under management and supermajority, have their own policies. So they may hire us and ISS and ultimately using our research as an input. So what are they using that input for? Well, ultimately, it's risk management. Um, if we're looking at boards of directors, compensation plans, our goal and what we've been charged with is to identify any potential risk factors for um, as a shareholder. Now, I'm flabbergasted that you think we're captured by special interest because many of our clients submit proposals and we recommend against those, and we disclose that quite prominently. I think you know we take conflicts extremely seriously. Anytime there's any sort of conflict, whether it's our owner, whether it's a personal conflict, that is disclosed specifically, prominently in every single report. Um, and we think that's absolutely essential because we think the per person with the conflict should have to disclose it. That's that's the burden. But in terms of, you know, the recommendations against for a company that doesn't adopt a majority vote uh, for a share proposal, no ENS share proposals passed this year. Um, so it's not like there's a wholesale number of these proposals that are being passed, and therefore we're taking action against uh, recommending uh, taking action against companies. The number of directors who fail to get a majority vote every year is about 50. So if you look at, multiply that by the number of director elections, it's infinitesimal. So there's certainly no evidence that there's this, you know, underlying um, destruction of boards or decapitation. In terms of the, the, the lawsuit, I think, you know, when you offer your opinion, whether you're a, um, a uh, credit rating agency, um, and we've seen their uh, defense, which I don't think is a good analogy because companies are, in effect, buying that rating. Right? And companies are required to use them to rate their, um, their uh, bond issuances. It, that doesn't have any really good correlation with what proxy advisors do. Our goal is really to allow our clients to make informed voting decisions. And when it comes to the market, you know, we were founded in 2003 with zero clients. Now we have nearly 1,000. Obviously, there are barriers to entry in terms of scale. You, you need to be able to provide a report, hopefully, um, 
few times, not just once, because it's make it very expensive to just make it uh, right for one. But we are obviously evidence that there are limited barriers to entry, and and uh, there are other firms out there. And the success we think is because the approach we've taken is not one size fits all, which is a, a quick knee jerk reaction thrown against proxy advisors with no evidence, uh, as well as some of the other comments you made. With due respect, I, I'm not sure where any of this is coming from, other than as a, a quick way to overestimate the purported influence. You heard Jill say it's six to ten percent, and then there are others, you know, reports and you know, where's the evidence of that? But ultimately, a lot of the focus on re um, advisors is based on this overestimation of the supposed power we have. And that has really, um, I think, driven some of the analysis in this case. Um, th there's, unless you're inside that individual's head, you don't know why they're making that voting decision. I worked at Fidelity for nine years, and um, we used uh, ISS, we used Glass-Lewis, we used uh, a whole bunch of different um, uh, research providers, and we ultimately made every decision ourselves. We touched every single proxy. Now, if it's a declassified board proposal, that takes two seconds to make that decision, right? If it's a HB compact decision, that could be very different because you have investors, uh, investment managers lining up on different sides of that. Um, so those decisions take considerably longer. So I think there, um, for the most part, are, are what we've seen are, is a progression of clients. Clients, I think, maybe 20 years ago, just tend to vote with management. Then there was a progression to um, look to outsource some of that uh, data collection um, as you know, clients grew. And now the um, situation is, as you heard Glenn describe, is investors make up their own decisions. They use um, uh, input from advisors. And um, I think there's, there's, there's little evidence that um, there's uh, the vote recommendations are causing the um, vote results. I think there's correlation, and it would be absolutely surprising if there wasn't significant correlation because a lot of the policies we develop are based on conversations from our clients, so it's sort of, you know, the tail wagging the dog necessarily. I, I think it's more the conversation with clients helps inform us on, she just, you know, what is Glenn thinking about certain issues, and, and I talk to all our other clients, and that really helps us develop our policies. We don't have a formal um, survey process for, for asking clients, but we do engage with them quite frequently. And really, we ask them to push us on the information they want so they can make a better decision. You know, I was, I was surprised in the answer to my question, and thank you for your, for your eloquence, um, but you said, when I said, you know, what's your goal, what are you trying to do, you said empower our clients to make good decisions, and you also mentioned risk management. What you didn't mention, uh, we're trying to enhance shareholder value. I mean, is, isn't that an objective? That's inherent in allowing clients to have the information to make informed voting decisions to enhance their, um, their returns. But clients have different strategies. They may have diff different time horizons. So our goal is not to set up research and tie it back to absolute direct improved performance. It's really to allow clients to have that information to make an informed voting decision. Now, if our bias is in terms of the way we uh, make recommendations, it's to uh, foster, I would say, medium to long-term performance um, uh, value creation. But, you know, recognize clients use the information in different ways. But when you're, when you're making a recommendation on, say, on pay, isn't the ob objective to, aren't you saying, well, this, this CEO is being over, we think this CEO is being overpaid, and as a result of that, uh, the shareholders are not being well served, and the value of the company is going to decline or not go up as much as it should. Yeah, I mean, first, the there's, there's the actual cost to the company of all that money that potentially is being paid, and but ultimately, we're looking at the alignment. You know, I get pushed by the press sometimes. That I, don't you think this money is too high? I said, no. It's really is it aligned with performance, and that's really what we look at. So our goal is um, to provide information both quantitatively through our performance model. Um, and qualitatively in terms of like what are the specific aspects of this company that we think make sense for a good incentive program for shareholders, both to attract, retain and executives, and also that is really ultimately tied to performance. And that's really the goal of looking at say on pay. Um, let me turn to Alan next. And, and actually, what I'd like to ask you, Alan, is, is, is a kind of an over, kind of an open-ended question because uh, just kind of what what is what is the state of research on these uh, on these subjects? For example, uh, you know, are the recommendations actually enhancing shareholder value? How much impact? I know Jill went into this. How much impact do the uh, proxy advisory services have? Those are two, for example. 
Sure. I mean, I, <coughs> I think Jill uh, discussed the influence of proxy advisors on the on the votes and the, the way that votes are cast. I think that. Well, oh, I think hit your uh, microphone button I, there. I think there's there's uh, plenty of room for debate as to uh, what drives the actual votes. Is the is that people simply following proxy advisors? Are proxy advisors aggregating market views? Uh, our perspective, or our question, um, I and, and my co-authors uh, set out to answer several years ago uh, was a little bit different. We, we wanted to understand, do boards of directors actually do anything with this input that they're receiving from shareholders? Um, and uh, you know, there's, there's two parts to that. One is, is do they take, and then, and then that's the first part, do, do boards do anything, and then secondarily, do they uh, do those actions that they take actually help or hurt shareholders? Um, so the first thing we did was we went out, went out and asked them. We did a survey with the NASDAQ and the conference board, and we asked directors and senior executives whether they looked at proxy advisor advisors' policies and whether those policies affected their say on pay plan and equity plan designs. And 70% of companies out there said that yes. We take those into account, and, and I forget the specific stat, uh, about 50% of companies said once we took those into account, we made changes along the dimensions of those policies. Uh, one particular thing that, I don't know, just, yeah, that, um, you know, I, I, I put up this slide because it, it uh, I'm an academic and I'm supposed to have slides, and <laughs> because I think it's a, it's a particularly striking example of, of where the proxy advisor policies can influence actual plan design. So this is a histogram of equity plan proposals, stock option and restricted stock plans that companies have to propose to shareholders and relative to the, IS, the key cri ISS criteria of sh the shareholder value transfer. And ISS generates a number, they call it shareholder value transfer, which is more or less, uh, it, it, it's a very difficult number to come up with on your own for any given company in any given year. Uh, I've spent a lot of time trying. Um, but you can hire ISS, and you can know exactly what it's going to be prior to putting your plan into a proxy statement. And what you see is this big spike is where people hit that number on the head. So presumably, they've hired either somebody that's better at figuring out that number than I am or ISS themselves. They are designing their plan to meet the maximum allowable cap, the maximum number of shares that ISS would give them under, their, uh, under, this, under this SVT construct. Um, so, you know, if you stop there, I actually think the evidence is, is quite positive. What we see is, is today, and even compared to, to 10 years ago, and, and when the genesis of a lot of this was put in place, boards of directors are extremely responsive to this voting mechanism. They care a lot about what these votes are, and they're taking a lot of actions through outreach, through plan designs, through actual changes in their governance programs to respond to them. Maybe not enough, but, but they're certainly taking more, I think, than they were, much more than they were 10 years ago. So the second question is, 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 is this good or bad ultimately for shareholders? Um, it's a very difficult thing to measure because you know, what you're looking at are, tend to be fairly strong, small transactions. But let me highlight three studies that I think are informative here. The first two are studies that, that I and my co-authors have, have worked on. Uh, one, we looked at the say on pay vote. So say on pay, as, as we all know, was required in Dodd-Frank and, and to be held at your first annual shareholder meeting in 2011. Uh, we looked at companies and the changes to compensation programs that they made uh, prior to that first say on pay vote. And when they, those companies were in danger of violating uh, proxy advisor policies, for instance, some of the pay for performance relative measures that they use, um, they put in made other changes to their compensation plans that were aligned to align themselves uh, more strongly with proxy advisor policies. And we find that when they, when they do that, when they take that action, put in those plans that are aligned with proxy advisor policies, that that's actually uh, bad for shareholders. There's a, a modest but significant negative return on those events. Um, the second thing that we looked at was a much more limited uh, um, transaction, but it, it's much more clearly defined, which is stock option exchanges. So we went through the financial crisis. A lot of companies had stock options that were underwater, and they wanted to basically cancel those stock options and replace them with some, something else. Uh, and the proxy advisors have very structured uh, policies around how they view these stock option exchanges. And when companies designed a plan, on average, these, these stock option exchanges were, were good programs. They were beneficial to, to shareholders when boards undertook them. 
but the, the benefit was reduced by more than half when you constrained that uh, when you constrain that program to a program that met the ISS concerns. So um, here again, you look at the constraints that, that, that um, the proxy advisors are, are placing, and, and it's not entirely clear that they are binding companies that would otherwise do bad things, uh, and they may be preventing some companies from taking actions that are beneficial to, to uh, shareholders. I think a contrasting study, uh, which, which is not ours, um, is one that looks at contested direct, director elections. And I think the interesting thing here is this is a very different setting. These are much, much more, less frequent transactions. Uh, and in this case, proxy advisors, uh, I don't know if this is necessarily true with, with uh, Glass-Lewis, but ISS has a special team that, special teams of, of specialists that look at uh, contested director elections and they look at M&A transactions, and when they dive in with that special team, when they do a lot of firm-specific research, they can actually, they're actually beneficial in helping shareholders to identify when a dissident slate is in fact gonna be beneficial to that company, when that board actually needs to be booted. So, you know, I think there is an opportunity to do firm-specific research. It's not to say that, that you can't do research and, and have it be valuable, um, but what we find is that, you know, having boards react to fairly structured policy statements um, has, has tended to be a negative, negative consequence for people. Um, Bob, do you have any reaction to that? Yeah, I think in particular the stock option repricing one, and that's 230 some, something companies. I think, you know, for the most part, um, all the major mutual funds and public pensions have policies on how they evaluate stock option repricing. So I think, and they're all very similar in terms of excluding senior management and trying to make it value for value. So to, to just focus solely on the proxy advisors guidelines, which are extremely similar to the mutual funds, I think maybe discounts the, 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 um, the, the telling nature of that, that study because I think um, most investors sh share the same concerns and about the design of those of those programs and you know I think repricings are, are a, a challenging situation anyway because the companies wouldn't do it unless they were in trouble so and they're in significant trouble their stock box the you know, stock price has fallen so much they need to basically you know cancel the existing grants and, and grant new ones you know while shareholders are stuck with a uh, stock price that they paid full value for that collapsed so that's why the significant they can't reprice their that. stock right they, they bought it for you um, what do you think about the say on pay? Um, that one, I think, um, I, I find it surprising that mutual fund managers who don't care at all about proxy voting would be monitoring how companies make changes to their compensation programs and then sell that share uh, accordingly, that there's going to be that sort of market reaction. Um, I, I, I guess I'm somewhat dubious as to that connection, having been a mutual fund company and recognizing that there are thousands of these votes to think that this uh, monitoring of some of the changes that companies make to a compensation program would actually have an effect on a, uh, that they're being monitored at all, uh, I, I guess I'd be pretty surprised. But I, I'm, I'm not the expert on it, so I haven't delved into the data. Do you do research or do you fund research on these? These seem to me to be essential questions. You know, when you're making a recommendation, is it going to enhance a shareholder value or not? And we can all kind of guess, but actually the, and I know that th this kind of research is difficult to do but yeah. do you ever do you fund any of it or do any we of don't it? we don't fund it um, we're, we're not that large yet but uh, we do provide uh, data to academics who study these sorts of issues and and uh, we have done so in the, in the past um, and we think it's essential to look at that because when we look at say independent chairman someone mentioned that earlier the academic evidence is all over the map on that one and when we discuss that issue in our guidelines and our proposal analysis uh, we laid that out for our clients so they get a sense, geez, the data is really inconclusive on this, but then we sort of fall back a bit on the philosophical, well, you know, what is the role of the board? And I don't want to go into too much detail, so we do look a lot at academic evidence on these sorts of things, but we haven't necessarily commissioned any ourselves. Okay, I want to move to Hester before we get to the floor, and uh, Steve, right in the beginning, brought up the issue of how how do we regulate this? What, what, what should the policies be? That is the essential question. And uh, Hester, sort of it, in, in your work and in the recommendations in the paper, uh, what, what, are, what, what are your suggestions on what the policies should be? Well, I think we do need to go back um, a little bit, and we need to, to ask the question, and these are questions that have been raised today, but 
is it really in the interest of a lot of these people to be spending any any shareholder resources, any um, resources on voting? And in many cases, it may not be. And I think that I agree with Steve that you can't have a, a vote by, by vote decision about whether to abstain, but you might have a policy um, that you are going to vote with management um, in all cases, in certain cases, and that should be up to the individual fiduciary to set that policy for itself. I think we're in the situation we're in now because there's a real belief among fiduciaries that they have to vote. And so what are they going to do? They're going to end up relying on outside um, advice um, to vote because that's the safest thing. It is. That's a, you're buying yourself a little protection if you can just outsource it to someone else. Um, and so one thing you need to do is, is remove any mandate to vote, I think, and you need to remove um, all these extraneous votes. Dodd-Frank added the say on pay vote, which was, needless to say, unrelated to the financial crisis. Um, and it, uh, one of the many provisions of Dodd-Frank, they could be eliminated. But encouraging all these votes is a waste of a lot of people's time. So, so getting rid of that, um, I would say, is the next step, and just really getting getting fiduciaries to focus on what makes sense for them in terms of voting. You know, uh, Har Harvey Pett had said uh, earlier in describing the original rule that what the SEC was asking was that uh, mutual funds explain what their policy is. So could you imagine a mutual fund saying, you know, our policy is that in all cases we vote with management. And if you don't like it, uh, you know, go to another mutual fund. I mean, there are lots of options, and there was. I mean, is that a legitimate option? I think it's legitimate, and there was language in the original rule that sort of alluded to the fact that you don't have to vote. So um, I think that that needs to be taken seriously. One concern I have with some of the recommendations for improvements out there is, you know, okay, let's get these proxy advisors to be more transparent about their methodologies and about their conflicts. But implicit in that is the notion that then it's going to make these guys even safer to rely on, and that there's going to be even more pressure to rely on them. Mm -hmm. So I would really focus on directing fiduciaries and telling them to take seriously the option of, of not voting at all. What, what do you think of Steve's idea, which I, which I kind of like, about uh, limiting the requirement to vote to uh, your large holding. So if Vanguard may hold, you know, 300 shares of some stock worth a million dollars, they don't have to vote on that. But if they, if they own, you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of uh, a stock, they do. Well, but again, I think, that could, I think that's a great idea, but I think it could be done at the, instead of doing it by regulation, mm -hmm. that could be in the policy and say, we only vote if we have a certain percentage of the company. Okay, I want to open, the, uh, open up the floor. Yes. Benjamin K, U.S. Treasury. So if we want to assess whether or not these votes matter, why don't we set up a market in selling the votes? And then if the votes have some value, then we'll see it. And if they don't, then we'll see that too. <laughs> Paul. Well, that's a great uh, question. And, you know, indeed, why not? Because if the Department of Labor and other people say it's an asset, then why can't you alienate it? Now, the SEC, though, unfortunately, the staff, um, uh, it's, I don't know that it's actually a, a rule, but the staff has basically said, no, 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 you may not do that. Um, and so it's, you know, inalienable. And in fact, going back to the Wall Street rule and other things, um, fiduciaries of institutions can outsource to these proxy advisors how they're going to vote, and they can almost slavishly follow it. I mean, they do in practice, but in, in uh, you know, in theory, they, they um, think about it. But for me or you or any individual, we cannot do anything similar, but we have to have in our hot little hand the actual proxy um, statement from the company before we can, like, delegate to our broker. Hence, you know, they did away with um, with a Rule 452 at the New York Stock Exchange, which allowed the broker no vote. So no, so, you know, shareholders, even for precatory things, you know, have to uh, instruct, you know, item by item. How Isn't that a little inconsistent? 
that as a shareholder, you're not allowed to say to your broker, uh, yeah, we hold this in, you hold this in street name, I'm telling you, go ahead, you make your own decisions. Right. I, it's, I think that's completely inconsistent. But again, this is a staff-driven thing at the SEC, so, you know, we're going to have to have a different... By the way, is it, was, that a, was that question kind of a reductio ad absurdum, or is actually actually the position of the Treasury Department? <laughs> certainly be clear that my uh, my opinions totally do not inform the position of the U.S. Treasury Department. Okay, all right, all right. I knew that. I knew that. Uh, yes, Alex? Uh, Paul, if I could address this to you, uh, building on this last set of thing, things, we have a very large uh, universe of agents, uh, being the institutional managers, with and all of whom have agency problems just like boards and managements are correctly said to have agency problems. And then we have the proxy advisors who aren't even agents, they're just guys selling opinions. But the real shareholders, who actually own the shares, being the retail uh, shareholders, as you suggested in a speech in 2008, <laughs> Mr. Uh, SEC Commissioner, Mr. Atkins, uh, discussed the very low level of, of voting of their shares by the people who are real owners, namely retail uh, owners. Uh, isn't there something in all this that we ought to think about in terms of uh, facilitating the voters? I completely agree they ought to be able to delegate their voting to a broker, for example, but are there, are there other issues around the, the low participation of the real owners? Yeah, well, I think, you know, probably like you like me, I mean, well, I you know travel a lot, and by the time I get home and look at the my inbox at the bottom of the barrel, or you know these proxy, um, you know cards and whatnot to turn in, and you know half the time it's it's or most of the time, almost all the time, it's not worth my while to go through for my tiny little number of shares to to vote them. Uh, I remember saying that at one point to. Um, uh, you know, a, an official at the New York Stock Exchange who was completely indignant that here this commissioner of the SEC was not voting his um, <laughs> proxies. Well, it's not worth my time. And especially for the uh, precatory ones, which have no real um, meaning. And so, uh, you know, now I, I try, I usually vote with management almost all the time. Um, because uh, if not, then I would sell my shares and get out of the company. But uh, anyway, um, but I think that we should be able to give uh, institutions that uh, right as well. That's a uh, that's a very important question, and actually, I'm going to ask Glenn. Is Glenn still here? Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, let me just make one comment. Just I, I've been writing uh, a financial column for an, you know, an investing column for small investors now for 21 years, and including for the Washington Post for 11 years, and I have never ever been asked a question about um, how to vote my 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 proxy. Um, and I'm just wondering whether investors, who are the actual people who own the shares, really care about this kind of stuff, and whether we constructed an edifice here um, over an issue that's not particularly important to the actual owners. So do you get lots of calls at Vanguard about how to vote uh, at the next annual meeting? No, not at all. Um, so, oh, let's, No, not at all. We, we hear from our clients very infrequently about, about proxy voting. Typically, the only time we hear about it is they send us a clipping of a newspaper article about executive pay at Chipotle and say, I hope you guys are watching this. Um, it, it, but it is, you know, it is very infrequent that we hear from clients at all about it. Um, we believe, by and large, they understand that They've, <clears throat> they've engaged Vanguard to manage their money, and that includes buying and selling stuff. It includes voting at shareholder meetings. It, closed, it includes all of the things that attach to ownership of securities, and they understand if they take the time to review our, our policies and our guidelines and our 35,000 pages of vote-by-vote -vote <laughs> disclosure exactly what we think and exactly how we've how we've met those methods. Do, do you think that's it, or do you think that, that they buy the stock or they buy the mutual fund because they want it to go up and they don't really think that corporate governance has 
too much to do with whether it's going to go up or not. Or, and, if, and if it doesn't go up, then, as, as Paul said, they can, they can exit. Uh, and we, we know the importance of voice as well as exit, but um, it just may not be very important to them. Yeah, I, I don't know what, what, which of those two alternatives it is. I just I know that we hear with very inf we hear very infrequently about it, um, and you know so whatever conclusions we want to draw from that. Thank you. Uh, Peter has a question. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, it's working. Um, there's a question I have that's a little bit off topic, but it sounds to me as though you have a problem with institutional investors casting votes, the broker dealers uh, aren't uh, permitted to cast votes, the retail uh, investor isn't interested in voting. Isn't there a problem with having a quorum at um, board meetings and is that, at, I mean, at uh, shareholder election meetings and isn't that something we ought to be thinking about too? Glad, glad you raised that issue. But you want to address yeah. that, Paul? Well, that's that's a really, uh, I, I don't know that that's so much the case at operating companies, but with mutual funds, that's a huge issue because the 40 Act, you know, basically prescribes that shareholders need to vote on a whole host of things, um, approval of management contract uh, with the advisor and, you know, a lot of other things. But most people, especially, you know, like money market mutual funds and stuff, they couldn't be bo bothered with uh, that. And so now uh, there are uh, fund advisors who have to hire proxy, proxy solicitors to go out and try to drum up Vote so that they you're talking about for the for the, the advi you're, you're talking about for the funds themselves, for the like themselves, Vanguard, so for the Vanguard. Fund. Exactly right. Not for. But what about issuers? I, I think operating companies. I don't. I don't. Haven't really heard of any um, problems on the quorum issue, but it could be theoretically. I think. Steve. Yeah, we um, back in the PGI days, and I think Bob can attest to this as well. Um, quorums sometimes are difficult to get, and uh, you do have as a fallout if one were to go to a rule that said you don't have to vote at all, the question of how you actually get quorums for a number of companies. Uh, one might say there might be an unintended consequence of that, which is management might actually talk to their shareholders and. You know, heaven forbid that that dialogue actually occur, but it might actually result in people going out of their way to at least talk to their larger shareholders to make sure they would show up and vote at the meeting. It may not be a bad result. So, but, you know, it, I think it comes back to the, the fundamental question of we can regulate proxy advisors. That's one possibility. I think it's a terrible mistake. I don't think anybody can go there uh, reasonably. Or you can basically say, why don't you let the market decide? And if proxy advisors are providing useful information, people will hire them. If they're not providing useful information, people won't. The problem is right now you have to hire them because of the way the rules are perceived to work, whether or not people want to argue as to whether or not that's actually what they require. So I think Hester's um, uh, example of having something that says you could have a policy and the policy is we vote only our larger holdings, that's not a bad result. That would be actually a potentially good policy, but it would also help solve some of your quorum problem because if you did have Vanguard only vote their large ones, as Jill mentioned before, you can have 99% of the small guys all slavishly following Glass-Lewis or ISS. It doesn't really matter that much if Vanguard and all the big guys do something different. It also works that same way for quorums. If Vanguard and the big guys all decide that they're going to vote their major holdings, there will be quorums. You will get, in fact, the quorum. Uh, so I don't perceive Vanguard uh, withdrawing from the field altogether. Maybe they would. Uh, my guess is they won't. My guess is T. Rowe won't, Fidelity won't, et cetera. Uh, but I think if you can get them to focus on the 200, 300 companies that actually matter to them instead of the 3,800 companies they happen to touch, uh, you might actually get not only heterogeneous views in terms of corporate governance, but a much better debate in terms of corporate governance as to what really does matter, what really is the right vote for something, because then they would actually care, because they've got people who could focus on a couple hundred or 100 or 50, as opposed to trying to focus on 3,800, which means you're not going to get the same level of analysis. Yeah, what, what will happen is Vanguard may not be the, the biggest holder in those, but there will be some other smaller mutual fund for those small companies. I mean, Vanguard has some interest in, in small micro-cap and nano-cap company stocks, but you get mutual funds that specialize in that. They will be the holders of those. They will vote. But you're right. At some point, you may actually have to have a small company reach out to Vanguard and say, please, we need to have your quorum present here. For, we need to have you to be quorum uh, uh, consistent for our vote. 
and they may actually have to talk to Vanguard and try to get them to show up, which doesn't seem like a terribly bad idea. Thank you for your skepticism about regulation. And that raises one other question I, I just wanted to ask Bob. So, um, it, and Damon brought this up. Uh, ISS is a registered investment advisor, and you, Glass Lewis, is not. Is there a reason for that? We, uh, when we launched, we were, this is before my time, we were actually did register as an investment advisor. It was um, something that we saw that ISS was, and we felt that it was uh, something that we needed to be. And then on the advice of outside counsel, um, uh, she counseled us that not only did we not need to be, but we really shouldn't be because we didn't really fit the um, definition of investment advisor in that we weren't making any buyer sell recommendations, we weren't custodying assets, we weren't making recommendations on um, uh, even from a, a pension type uh, program. Um, but we did keep what we thought were the most salient features of that in terms of um, um, uh, code of ethics and prior trade clearance and that, that sort of thing and, and duplicate reporting. So I think, you know, from our perspective, we think um, regulation is, is um, um, if, if appropriate, could be really helpful. But, you know, some of the concerns that are leveled at us are still leveled at uh, ISS and they've been a registered investment advisor. So that clearly hasn't resolved the conflicts or, or quality or some of the other concerns that people raise. Um, what we think is, um, a better solution is more of a market-based solution. Um, kind of building off of what what, um, what we've heard is um, that uh, you know using a, a code of best practices, and it's something that we've worked with other groups, including ISS in Europe, to develop this, and uh, really building on some of the research found in uh, Canada and Europe, where they didn't find a market failure, they didn't see a need for regulation. They said, well, let's have a, a code of practices that groups can. Um, um, help design and then get with input and then um, ESMA is going to revisit this in a couple of years and see if it's working or not and we think that's probably a better solution. Bonnie, you always have long questions. You, you, if you keep it down to five seconds because we're going to really end at noon. <clears throat> okay, ten seconds. All right. One for Mr. McCormick, one for Mr. Wallman. They're both ten seconds. Mr. McCormick, uh, well, you think about this. Does Warren Buffett have a problem with his compensation? He takes a modest salary. It's not incentive-based. He owns 20% of the company. Yes, I've run into that situation also. Now, to Mr. Wallman, in terms of fixing this, can we defer to, can, if I were a mutual fund, I'd want to say, I want to vote with Vanguard, or I want to vote with Fidelity or BlackRock, whichever is my favorite. Do you think the rules could be shaped potentially to allow that? No, they can be, but uh, in fact, at PGI, we had this technology to do precisely that. And so you could actually say, I want to vote with these folks if, in fact, they publish what they were going to do. So you, CalPERS, for example, would publish in some cases in advance what it was intending to do on a vote. And so you actually could do that. Technology allows you to do a lot of different things. You can blend them. You can do all sorts of things like that. Uh, just the last comment then on, on, on that part is one, one concern with having policies that people put in place that required or put in place how they would vote all sorts of different issues also made this very homogenous. It also became something where people would say, for all these kinds of things, you know, splitting the board, or the chairman and the CEO, we vote yes or we vote no. That's thoughtless, right? Because in some companies you actually want to say, we think these positions should be together. In other companies you may say, we don't think they should be together. But again, because of this notion of sort of a policy or a code that people had put in place, and the fact that you were then going to do it across 3,800 companies, you can't spend the time to actually look at any particular case. And so, unless it's brought to your attention, there's something specifically controversial about it. Uh, generally, you just vote as a policy would be established. So we actually built the technology to do that, which is what people wanted. And an awful lot of people did what we call auto vote. Uh, they, uh, we'd feed in the information, the data would go in, and the technology would take care of how they voted. That just doesn't sound like great corporate governance to me at the end of the day. So I'm going to intervene on the, uh, on the Warren Buffett thing. You can discuss that afterwards. Um, thank you all so much. This has been a great morning. Um, we brought together some incredible expertise. The only thing I feel bad about was everybody didn't get that much chance to uh, to talk, uh, but we but we really do appreciate uh, the time that you've all devoted to this, especially those of you who've come from from uh, distant lands. And um, <laughs> if you'd like to watch a rerun, you can do that by going to the AI.org site, um, and you can certainly read uh, read the the Hester Jim paper or uh, any of the great work by the 
by many of the panelists here. So thank you all for coming.